If the verdict in the O.J. Simpson murder trial outraged you because you feel that a double murderer walked out of a courtroom, much like this one, a free man, don't feel alone. Approximately 70% of all Americans feel the same way. How could a man so obviously guilty evade punishment? Was it because of a racially biased jury, a judge's improper rulings, unscrupulous and devious defense attorneys? How could this miscarriage of justice have happened? My name is Vince Bugliosi, and as a former prosecuting attorney, the verdict in the O.J. Simpson criminal trial has made me a part of that approximately 70%. I was angry enough, in fact, to write a book entitled Outrage, The Five Reasons Why O.J. Simpson Got Away with Murder. Let me say that this was not a book I had intended to write. In fact, my book editor had to talk me into it, overcoming my original disinclination to do so. What finally convinced me is that millions of Americans were outraged and wanted an answer. How could O.J. Simpson have gotten away with two brutal murders? So I wrote the book. And then recently, after having thought I had put the subject behind me, I was approached and eventually persuaded by the producers of this video of the need to give the Simpson case an additional dimension so that apart from all the books on the case, there would exist an in-depth visual case study and documentary for lay people, lawyers, and future students of the case. My motivation now, as it was then in originally writing the book, is the same. To give the outraged public answers to the questions they were asking. Since Simpson was clearly guilty, how could this case have been lost? I'm confident I'll be able to give you the answers. However, you would be well advised not to expect me to be too mellow or sweet-natured in my remarks during this program. And when the prosecution in the Simpson case presented scientific DNA evidence that Simpson's blood was found at the murder scene, they did, in fact, prove Simpson's guilt, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond all doubt. And an average jury would have convicted Simpson. But this jury of nine blacks, two whites, and one Hispanic was below average. Number one, they weren't very bright. How do we know that? I'll tell you how we know. The not guilty verdict tells us these people were not very bright. Secondly, many of the blacks on the jury, perhaps all of them, probably had a built-in bias in favor of Simpson from the very beginning. However, and this is the important point, a powerfully presented case in summation, which we were light years away from in this case, where you put a bib on the jury and you spoon feed them, can almost always be counted upon to overcome both of these problems. You can overcome a jury that's not too bright. You can overcome a jury that's biased. The only type of jury that you can't turn around would be a jury whose state of mind was, even though we know O.J. is guilty, we don't care. We like O.J., blacks have been discriminated against by whites throughout the years, so we're going to give O.J. two free murders. But it would be extremely difficult to find even one juror with that outrageous state of mind, much less all 12. Yet in so many words, this is precisely what prosecutors Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden want everyone to believe. That they could have had a film of Simpson committing these murders, and this jury would have still found him not guilty. But to believe that, you'd have to believe that these jurors were just plain bad people. That they looked at the terribly gruesome photos of the victims in this case, and in effect said, we don't care. But looking at the backgrounds of these jurors, for instance, the foreperson was the 1990 Los Angeles County Employee of the Year, reading a book written by three of them, listening to their remarks on radio and television, I get no sense that even one of them had that unconscionable, outrageous state of mind, again, much less all 12. Being biased and being bad are two very different things. When you prosecute a case, you have to eliminate all possibilities of the jury coming back with a not guilty verdict. You have to be so powerful in your presentation of the evidence and final summation that the jury feels it has no choice but to convict. That if they don't convict when they know they should, they're going to have to live with that decision for the rest of their lives. The prosecution in this case didn't even begin to do that with this jury. People tend to forget that as bad as these prosecutors were, and we're talking F minus here, it doesn't get any worse. It cannot get any worse. On the first ballot this jury took back in the jury room, two jurors voted guilty. And if you can get a 10-2 vote on the first ballot with an F minus performance, you can imagine what would have happened if there had been an A plus performance, which the people of the state of California were entitled to. I'm personally convinced that even this jury would have come back with a verdict of guilty, or at an absolute minimum, a hung jury. If justice had prevailed in this case, O.J. Simpson would now be in San Quentin. He should not be a free man who is, in his words, quote, searching for the real killer. He only has to look in a mirror to do that. 
because, as I am confident I will convince you, O.J. Simpson is absolutely 100% guilty. If you get the impression I'm angry, you're right. For several weeks, right after the verdict, I was so angry I could have eaten nails. And to a great extent, I'm still angry. I've seen many murderers in my life, but none even approached O.J. Simpson for audacity. His demeanor throughout the case and in the wake of the verdict, taking audacity to previously unimaginable heights. For example, although he had administered several terrible beatings to his former wife, Nicole, causing her to fear for her life, and although he eventually killed her, in his farewell letter before his arrest, he actually referred to himself as a, quote, battered husband. Throughout the trial, his knowing what he had done in no way inhibited him from showing disgust and contempt for the prosecutors whenever they did anything at all which he perceived to be even slightly improper or unfair. In fact, his entire demeanor and body language indicated that he felt he was being put out by the trial, the trial being an interference with his very pleasant and enjoyable lifestyle. It was as if he felt that this one little messy incident on the night of June 12, 1994, shouldn't be held against him. After all, he was still O.J. Simpson, wasn't he? And during the trial, Simpson published a book of photographs and letters from supporters. Since many of the pictures were of Nicole, Simpson had shamelessly exploited for money the person he had murdered, the book making him more than one million dollars. At the defense's celebration party at Simpson's home on the night of the verdict, while two precious human beings were lying in their graves, Simpson, with a broad smile on his face, held a Bible up in the air with his outstretched right hand. A Bible. The word unbelievable, a tired adjective, doesn't really describe the type of audacity that Simpson demonstrated. And it wasn't enough for Simpson to walk out of court a free man with a smile on his face when the LAPD and DA's office knew he was guilty. He had to rub their noses in their defeat by actually demanding that they now go out and look for the real killer or killers, adding that it would be his, quote, primary goal in life to search for the person or persons who had killed his Nicole. By now we're all aware of just how exhaustive that search has been. No fairway or sand trap has been safe from his scrutiny. So yes, I am angry. In mid-December of 1995, Johnny Cochran threw a lavish celebration party for all the jurors. Picture Simpson with his sharp knife viciously stabbing Nicole and Ron Goldman to death while imagining the festive partygoers dining, laughing, and enjoying themselves. It's so goddamn I've seen there are no words for it. Simpson might just as well have shouted from the highest mountaintop that he had murdered these two people. In other words, this case was circumstantial in name only. Every place the suspect went, went he left some evidence. Fingerprints, blood, footprints, blood in his bronco, blood all over his driveway, house, clothes in his washing machine, blood on socks from the victim, blood in the shower, blood in the sink, empty knife boxes. Did we need anything else? It was obvious with all of this blood and all of these incriminating locations in his car. I mean, whoever blood, whosoever blood we find there, and certainly when we find later it's commingled with the victims, uh, that's going to be our suspect. There's blood here, there's blood there, there's blood there, and it all fits in <laughs> one category, Simpson, Goldman, Brown. Why is Nicole and Ron Goldman's blood in his house? Why is Nicole and Ron Goldman's blood in the Bronco? If he wasn't there to put it there. There really are only three possible explanations other than guilt for one's blood being found at the murder scene, and all three are preposterous on their face. One is that the blood was left there on a previous occasion. But when Simpson was interrogated by the LAPD detectives on the day after the murders, he said he had not cut himself the last time he was at the Bundy address a week earlier. Even without that, how can one believe that on some prior occasion, Simpson bled, not just on the Bundy premises, but at the precise point on the premises where the murders occurred, and also just to the left of the killer's bloody shoe prints leaving the murder scene. Moreover, per the testimony at the trial, the blood found at the murder scene was fresh blood. The second possibility is that Simpson got cut while defending himself. That is, Nicole or Ron Goldman or both unleashed a deadly assault on Simpson. And he either took out a knife he had on his own person or wrested theirs away and stabbed the two of them to death. This, of course, is just too insane to even talk about. It should be added that if such a situation had occurred, 
Simpson wouldn't have had any reason to worry, since self-defense is justifiable homicide. The third and final possibility is that the LAPD detectives planted Simpson's blood to the left of the bloody shoe prints leaving the murder scene. This is not as insane a proposition as the first two, but only because there are degrees of everything in life. It is still an insane possibility. And if any of you viewers are so naive as to believe that the LAPD detectives decided to frame Simpson for these murders by actually planting his blood all over the murder scene, as well as the victim's blood in his car and home, then in all deference, this program is probably not for you. This program is for people who are very angry that a brutal murderer is among us, with a smile on his face no less, and want to know how this terrible miscarriage of justice could have possibly occurred. I have four kids, two kids I haven't seen in a year. They ask me every week, Dad, how much longer? All right. Just proud of hope. All right. Mr. Simpson, you do understand your right to testify as a witness? Yes, I do. All right. And you choose to rest your case at this? All right. Thank you very much, sir. Another thing. I ask you to imagine that your spouse and her companion have been savagely murdered. Although you are innocent, you have been arrested for the murders and framed with false evidence. Is there any force or power on this earth that would keep you from proclaiming to the world, under oath, that you are innocent? Is there anything anyone could say to you that would stop you from answering all your accusers' questions with your denials of guilt? From this chair, I submit to you that no sound in any courtroom is as loud as the defendant's silence when he's accused of the most serious crime of all, murder, and he chooses not to deny it from the witness stand. When a person is falsely accused of a murder, a team of wild horses shouldn't be able to keep them out of this chair. Simpson never sat here, of course, because he was guilty. There is no other truly valid reason in this case for his not doing so. But Simpson, after the trial, wanted to tell the story to everyone else appearing on radio and TV talk shows, college campuses, even traveling to Europe to tell people what really went down. But not from here and not to them. The 12 people who could have convicted him of first-degree murder and sent him to prison for life, where he should be right now. I never thought for a second Simpson would risk himself by testifying even though he's narcissistic and, and he thinks he's above the law and all of those other... I think that he was dying to take the stand, couldn't wait to take the stand, but I think that deep down inside he knew there's no way that he would be able to get away with it. There's no attorney that wants his client on the witness stand, especially an attorney that believes or absolutely knows that his client's guilty. They do not want him up there. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. It's not a very good feeling to realize that our system failed, is it? All right, it, it, this guy, there's no doubt, there's no doubt what happened in this case. Absolutely no doubt whatsoever. The evidence is conclusive, it's overwhelming that Simpson committed these two murders. And we take him to the bar of justice and the bar of justice lets him go. And who suffers for it? We all do. We all lost. And I'm angry and I think, I think the masses in this country are angry because they feel that our system failed them. And it did fail them. It's, it's, it's not right. It's not right that this guy's walking free. You can slaughter two people and go out and play golf every day. It's not right. As I stated before, it's understandable how so many people can't comprehend how this could have happened. How could a man who committed two murders, whose own words and actions reeked with guilt, whose own blood was found at the murder scene, and who had the blood of his victims in his car and home, how could this person have been judged to be not guilty? I gave five reasons in my book, Outrage, for why O.J. Simpson got away with murder. But even these five can be distilled down to two. Number one, the jury could hardly have been worse. And number two, neither could the prosecution. But as I indicated earlier, as bad as this jury was, if the prosecution had given an A-plus rather than an F-minus performance, the verdict most likely would have been different.
When I saw signs being held up by people, even if you did it, we still love you, OJ, I thought it was uh, sick. Uh, out, of, uh, out of several hundreds of people uh, manning the roads during the slow speed Bronco chase, you're going to get a significant segment of nutcases. The mental midgets holding these signs were among the first manifestations of what I call the in the air syndrome. From the moment Simpson became a suspect, it was in the air, perhaps as in no other case within memory, that he might get off despite the conclusive evidence of his guilt. It was evident everywhere. People predicting confidently, this jury will never convict Simpson, even if they were shown a film of him committing the murders. People carrying signs outside the courtroom during the trial, declaring free OJ and save the Jews, and even whether you did it or not, we still love you, OJ. U.S. Senate Chaplain Richard Halverson, beginning the Senate's day on June 23, 1994, with a prayer for O.J. Simpson. And the prosecution was no better. The only direction in which all the evidence points is to O.J. Simpson. And I told you when this began that I had the hardest job. Nobody wants to do anything to this man. We don't. Can you imagine that? And Marsha Clark, during jury selection, said, you may not like me for bringing this case. I'm not winning any popularity contest for doing so. Can you believe this? The prosecution sounding almost apologetic to a jury when you believe the person you're prosecuting committed a brutal double murder? So this feeling, this sense, which permeated every segment of our society, was obviously known to the jurors before they were selected and then continued to manifest itself during the trial. Larry King on his talk show would ask any Simpson intimate, how's O.J. doing? All these signs of respect, of awe and affection, indicated that Simpson, even if guilty, might be given some break tantamount to a papal dispensation. And don't think for a moment that all of this wasn't getting back to the sequestered jurors, if by no other means than by the weekly conjugal visits with their loved ones in the privacy of their own quarters. This in-the-air phenomenon couldn't help but contribute in some way to the eventual not guilty verdict. It made it so much easier, either consciously or subconsciously, for the jury to give Simpson every benefit he was legally entitled to, and then some. And this man was treated better than, uh, than anybody I had ever seen in law enforcement, and probably one of the more brutal crimes. I mean, killing two people with a knife is not a simple act, and it's not a simple act of somebody that is actually dealing with a full deck. This is somebody that is a very violent person, very uh, fixated on killing these people. And yet, we let him walk out of Parker Center, get into his car, go back to his estate, uh, clean up your estate after the, the search warrant, and uh, sit out there and uh, ponder his uh, future. And then, guess what? Now we have a disguise, money, a gun, and a Bronco going down the freeway at 35. Yeah, there was a bias. Everybody gave him every opportunity not because of his race, but because he was a celebrity. My next guest is in our Burbank studio. Uh, welcome, uh, Vincent Pugliosi. Happy to be on the show, Charles. Thank you. <coughs> uh, you were, you were the, I, as far as I know, the first major uh, figure, uh, legal figure, to come forward and just aggressively say that O.J. Simpson is guilty. The, the, the evidence in this case points so obviously to Simpson's guilt. I mean, I, I can't think of another case other than, when the, other than where, of course, the killer is apprehended during the ap actual perpetration of the homicide, a case where guilt is more obvious. You literally could throw away 80% of the evidence, including the DNA evidence, and there'd be no question of his guilt. I know what happened. It's obvious that Simpson committed these murders, and there's just the game being played down there. That was an appearance of mine well before the verdict in the Simpson case. And I've been asked to explain more than once why, early on, not long after Simpson's arrest, I was saying publicly there was no question Simpson was guilty. I would normally have felt it unseemly and in poor taste for me, a member of the bar, or for any public official, to speak out on the issue of guilt before the verdict. And this was the very first time I had ever done so. I spoke out on the Simpson case for two reasons. Number one, I was trying to counter the in-the-air phenomenon we just talked about. I had never seen anything like this before in any other criminal case, and I definitely felt it had the potential of having a prejudicial impact on the prosecution's case, since the jury couldn't help but be aware of it and probably be adversely influenced in the process. And I was trying to counter what was happening. I was obviously unsuccessful. The second reason I spoke out was because I was disgusted by the tremendous groundswell of support for Simpson, even though two human beings had been brutally murdered and all the evidence pointed to Simpson as the perpetrator. 
He had received an incredible 350,000 letters of support at the time. And although each revelation of his guilt the media learned was clinically and dispassionately reported in the news, nearly all of the commentators on television nonetheless treated Simpson as if he were a very special human being. And not one of them dared to say one negative word about him. He even received special treatment in the county jail. And some people, unbelievably, went so far as to imply that even if he were guilty, hey, he's OJ, let him go. Why there was this enormous support for someone who had obviously committed two of the worst murders imaginable, I don't know. But I personally found it repulsive and repugnant, so I spoke out. By the way, throughout this program, you will not hear me call him OJ, as so many still do. To me, anyone who viciously carves up two human beings and leaves them lying in a pool of blood forfeits any right to any endearing nicknames. What's uh, been happening since we checked in last? Howard Weitzman suddenly announced he will no longer represent Simpson. Simpson's new attorney is Robert Shapiro. Let me tell you how the myth of the so-called dream team could have also contributed to the not guilty verdict in this case. My critique of the trial abilities of the main lawyers for the defense will not paint a very flattering picture. And in case any of you are thinking, well, they won, didn't they? I submit to you that surely no intelligent person would assess someone's performance simply by looking at the final result. Often results are traceable to factors and dynamics that have nothing at all to do with one's performance. Just like one can be brilliant in defeat, one can do an inferior job and still win. The defense won this case because of the terrible jury that heard it and the incredible incompetence of the prosecutors, not because of anything special at all done by the main lawyers for the defense. But right from the beginning, the simpletons in the media started referring to the defense lawyers as the best that money can buy, the dream team. Not in my book. Let's examine this dream team. And that is the range of death, isn't that correct? Robert Shapiro, Simpson's original lead attorney in a case the media had already christened the trial of the century, had never tried a murder case before in his entire career. What about the Christian Brando homicide case, you say? Shapiro did represent Brando, but pled him guilty and Brando was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He's a human being and he's not perfect. He's not proud of some of the things he did. Johnny Cochran had mostly made a name for himself, not as a criminal lawyer, but as a civil lawyer, successfully representing several black plaintiffs in police brutality cases against the LAPD and the LA Sheriff's Office. In fact, prior to the Simpson case, in his 32-year career, although he may have, I had never heard of Johnny Cochran winning one murder case before a jury. He's claimed to reporters that he has won a great many, but not one reporter, to my knowledge, has ever thought to ask him, Mr. Cochran, can you give us the name of just one of those cases? However, a researcher for a Playboy magazine piece on Cochran and a few other defense attorneys requested this specific information from Cochran's office no less than four times, but never received an answer to that question. Can you tell me whether or not, from the position you were standing, if you look... F. Lee Bailey, of course, is a very experienced trial lawyer who had distinguished himself in several murder cases. But Bailey's last big case, the Patty Hearst bank robbery case, had been over 20 years earlier, and he lost. Many in the legal community thought that the Hearst case was a very winnable one, but after a short and weak final summation by Bailey, his client was convicted, and Bailey's career thereafter went into a seemingly irreversible decline. It was believed that Shapiro, at the time a close friend of Bailey, wanted to bring Bailey aboard to resuscitate his career and at the same time avail himself of his considerable intelligence and experience. Defendant O.J. Simpson has the right to have his case decided by this jury and not some Alan Dershowitz subsequent Dershowitz was another jury. defense team lawyer who had also distinguished himself in the legal profession, but as a prominent appellate lawyer, not a trial lawyer. Dershowitz is someone you go to after you're convicted, though it took months for the media to finally figure this out. They immediately thought of him as a famous criminal defense attorney on the Simpson team, one who had successfully defended, they would write, Klaus von Bülow. But Dershowitz had not defended von Bülow, nor had he handled a single witness at von Bülow's trial. His involvement in that case had been in his securing a reversal, on appeal, of von Bülow's earlier conviction so there could be a second trial. It is not compromised or altered. Apart from the two DNA lawyers from New York, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, who are certainly among the top lawyers in the country in their particular field. The main lawyers for the defense were nothing to write home about, and their performance at the trial was spectacularly ordinary. So there they were, the very best lawyers money could buy. The media had anointed them the dream team, and no one was going to change that. It had become official. 
the Los Angeles Daily News stated after the trial, quote, Simpson's considerable personal wealth allowed him to hire the best defense attorneys in the country. The question I had at the time, and the trial only confirmed my need to ask it, was how do you take a lawyer who had never tried a murder case before, another who isn't even primarily a criminal lawyer, but a civil lawyer, who I don't believe had ever won a murder case before a jury in his entire career, another who lost the last big case he tried 20 years earlier, and another who isn't even a trial lawyer, and convert them into the dream team, the best that money can buy. By what bizarre convoluted logic or theory do you do this? The answer is you don't. Only the media could come up with nonsense like that. I'm not often known as a prognosticator, but in my Playboy magazine interview in December of 1994, which was before the trial, I said, quote, I'll guarantee you this, that if the outcome of the trial ends up being favorable to the defense, the result will have nothing to do with anything special the principal lawyers for the defense did. And the favorable result will have to be traceable to dynamics other than Simpson's innocence, since he's obviously guilty. And I said those other factors could be things like, quote, race, celebrity, and bogus allegations of police misconduct. I stand today by that original assessment. So this myth of the prowess of the dream team was in the air, just as were the sympathetic feelings for Simpson. The community containing the pool of prospective jurors was well aware of these things. And the jurors, like most people, probably fell prey to a common phenomenon. People often see what they expect to see or want to see, not what they are actually seeing. How could this tendency to see what we expect to see have any effect at all on the verdict in the Simpson case? It is likely that the Simpson jury perceived the courtroom performances of the defense attorneys as being more effective than they were because they saw what they expected to see. And what they expected to see were the defense lawyers scoring a lot of points in their questioning of witnesses, whether they were doing so or not. Because if they were the dream team, they must be scoring a lot of points. And this type of thinking may have contributed, if even in a small way, to reasonable doubt. In outrage, I give an assessment of the performances of Cochran and the other main lawyers for the defense. Let me briefly say a few words about Cochran. Johnny Cochran is an intelligent and seasoned courtroom performer. Although he's no heavyweight by any stretch of the imagination, he is for the most part an above average trial lawyer whom I actually expected more of during the trial. Cochran wasn't more than 10 or 15 minutes into his opening statement when it was very evident to me that in many ways he was a very mediocre criminal defense attorney. I had to chuckle when he told the jurors that they had to base their verdict on the facts and evidence not speculation and conjecture. Cochran was just talking and couldn't have thought out what he said because what he said was a prosecution argument. And in a case like this, where there was no evidence pointing towards Simpson's innocence, it was the worst thing to tell a jury. The only hope and chance the defense had at the time Cochran made his remarkable statement was that the jury would base its verdict not on the facts and evidence, but on speculation and conjecture. I mean, the box containing evidence favorable to the defense in this case was as empty as a bird's nest in winter. Also unbelievably, Cochran told the jury in his opening statement that Simpson's arthritis was so acute on the day of the murders that he couldn't even deal a hand of cards at the Riviera Country Club a few hours before the murders. But then he went on to tell the jury that Simpson was practicing golf with those same hands on the grounds of his estate at the time of the murders. Apart from that inconsistency, didn't Cochran even know that Simpson had already told the limousine driver he was sleeping during this period? And that when the LAPD detectives interviewed Simpson on the day after the murders and asked him all the things he had done on the night of the murders, he made no reference to either sleeping or playing golf? Then Cochran made this statement to the jury. Because the answer of O.J. Simpson's guilt or innocence would only be determined by you if you're able to do it. None of us. But guilt or innocence there. is not the issue. The jury's duty instead was to determine whether the prosecution had proved Simpson's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Furthermore, such an articulation is always harmful to the defense since it's easier for the prosecution to prove guilt when the alternative for the jury is innocence than it is for them to prove not just guilt but guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. 
The moment Cochran uttered those words, I knew he did not even have a firm grasp of the most fundamental rule at a criminal trial, that to convict, a defendant's guilt has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. He obviously understands it, but not well, because if he did, those words would have never come out of his mouth. You can talk about guilt, and you can talk about innocence, but never in the context of, quote, guilt or innocence being the issue for the jury to decide. There was perhaps no better example of the phenomenon of people seeing what they expect to see working to the prosecution's very definite disadvantage than the situation with one of the defense's expert witnesses, who was touted as being the best in his field. Now, Dr. Lee, if we assume that these parallel line imprint patterns come from a shoe, I, I think you've told us they are not consistent with the Bruno Magli or Mr. Goldman shoe, correct? Yes. In your experience at crime scenes, have you ever seen a single assailant wear two pairs of shoes? Oh. No. Dream Team lawyers eliciting valuable testimony damaging to the prosecution from an unassailable expert witness. The best in the business, right? Since that's what the jury expected to see, that's probably what they did see. But should they have? Since that time, sir, have you gone back to the Bundy walkway to examine that particular tile? Yes, I have. Yes, the area that you're referring to that I went back and examined is this area in here. And within that area, there are some <coughs> parallel lines. William Bodziak, the FBI's senior expert on shoe prints, debunked all of Lee's conclusions. Bodziak went to the crime scene with copies of Lee's June 25th photos to examine the shoe print and the other two imprints, which Lee said could be shoe prints. What he found there absolutely boggles the mind. With blown up color photographs, he pointed out to the jury that the parallel line imprint was actually tool marks made by the workers in the lane of the cement years earlier. And the other imprint was a shoe print from one of these workers, which was a permanent indentation in the concrete with ridges and depressions that Bodziak felt with his own hands. Uh, the seventh row of tiles, uh, there was actually uh, almost an entire well-defined shoe print uh, of a left shoe that was made by stepping in the concrete tile before it was dried. And it was there since the day this tile was poured, and I imagine it will always be there. Is it a Bruno Mali shoe, sir? No, it's not. This was an incredible revelation, and was just one of several areas where Lee's conclusions were shown to be simply incorrect. The third imprint, which Lee had testified was a shoe print, was in fact a shoe print. But the prosecution established it was not left at the time of the murders. LAPD photographs on June 13th of the same area Lee photographed on June 25th do not show the shoe print, proving it was a shoe print of someone, such as a police officer or criminalist, who left it there after the 13th, but before all the blood was washed away several days later. So how did Marsha Clark discredit Dr. Lee, his conclusions, and therefore the defense's attempt to introduce a second killer for the jury? This jury that had been hanging on Dr. Lee's every word. Now, Dr. Lee tried to tell us about a second set of shoe prints, as you recall, but I think Mr. Bodziak made it very clear what that was all about. Marcia, do you really think those very few and general words were sufficient to make this jury realize the terrible error Dr. Lee had made? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to at this time take this opportunity to publicly thank you for the service that you've given to us. The burdens that we've placed upon you were enormous, and I words can't begin to express the debt that we owe to you for the time and patience and exertion that you've given to us during the course of this case. This was equivalent to a verbal obscenity. How dare Judge Ito tell this jury after the verdict that society owed them a debt of gratitude when they came back with a verdict that was not only incompatible with the evidence, but had been reached after an inexcusably brief three and a half hours. However, in all fairness to the jury, although there's no question they should have deliberated longer than they did, one has to realize that the jury was undoubtedly forming opinions throughout the trial, despite Ito's constant admonitions. All right, having said that, please remember all my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you.
do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock sharp. Actually, this instruction makes no sense. Since it is impossible for a human being to not form opinions as they listen to testimony coming from the witness stand. In fact, even if it were possible to not form any opinion, that wouldn't even be desirable since you wouldn't want a juror in the jury room to have to go back in his mind and start evaluating for the very first time testimony and evidence that came from the witness stand weeks and months earlier. In reality then, jurors naturally and automatically form impressions and opinions during the trial, which is okay. The opinions just shouldn't be firm and final. But it is hard to imagine how this jury could have been much worse. If the comments of some of the dismissed jurors were any indication of the thinking processes of the remaining ones, then the prosecution was definitely in trouble. I spoke to um, one of the dismissed jurors, Willie Cravens, I believe was his last name, and he told me that he believed that O.J. Simpson was framed, that he believed that the police are not to be trusted, he believed that the uh, evidence was not to be trusted, and it scared me. I sat next to him on uh, one of the afternoon shows, I think it was the Geraldo show, and we talked during the break about that. And he also told me that he thought that O.J. Simpson did not uh, commit these crimes. One in particular, when he was talking about uh, blood, uh, you know, everybody bleeds at their house. So, so O.J. Simpson bled at his house. What does that mean, you know? That's, that's, that shows intelligence level there. The prosecution definitely being in trouble proved, of course, to be the case. As for the jurors who remained, one, a 72-year-old black woman, said during the jury selection process that she never read newspapers, magazines, or books. The only publication she subscribed to was a racing forum, and she said she really didn't even understand it. This juror, after the verdict, was quoted as saying, I didn't understand the DNA stuff at all. To me, it was just a waste of time. It was way out there and carried absolutely no weight with me. In case you think she had cornered the market on ignoring important trial issues, listen to another female juror. To me, that was a waste of time. This was a murder trial, not domestic abuse. If you want to get tried for domestic abuse, go in another courtroom and get tried for that. It was obvious that she missed the connection. Syndicated columnist Kathleen Parker observed that this juror's reasoning was, quote, akin to saying obesity is unrelated to eating. If it's eating you want to talk about, go somewhere else. This discussion's about fat. My own personal feelings, if O.J. runs out there naked as a jaybird today and swear, you know, he did it, it will still not change my decision because what I said is that the prosecution did not prove it to me. The seminal question is whether this murder trial had to be cursed with this jury. The answer is no. The murders happen in Brentwood, which is in the Santa Monica Judicial District. There are 11 judicial districts in Los Angeles, and the policy in L.A. is to try the case in the judicial district where the crime occurred. In my December 1994 Playboy magazine interview, which as I mentioned was before the trial started, I criticized District Attorney Gil Garcetti for his decision to try the case downtown. The magazine was on the stands on November the 1st, 1994. On November the 4th, Garcetti called me on the phone. Vincey said that was a great interview in Playboy, but I wanted to explain to you why we're trying the case downtown. I said, yeah, Gil, I wish you would. Well, he said, it may not have been this way when you were in the office, but today, when you take a case to the grand jury, you're stuck downtown. I told him, Gil, not only wasn't it that way when I was in the office, but it's still not that way. And if you don't believe me, call Jerry Ann Hazlett, the spokesperson for the Los Angeles County Superior Court, and she'll confirm to you that just because you take a case to the grand jury doesn't preclude you from thereafter transferring it back to the judicial district where the crime happened for the trial. Whereupon Garcetti said to me, on my children's lives, well, I was under the impression that we were stuck downtown. So here we have a momentous decision being made by the district attorney, and he's basing it on his impression as opposed to having his staff thoroughly research the matter. In outrage, I give several examples of cases which were taken to the grand jury and then transferred back to the judicial districts like Van Nuys, Pasadena, Long Beach, or Santa Monica for the trial. I don't have a racist bone in my body, but when you have a case that was supposed to be tried in Santa Monica, the wrongful death civil case against Simpson was tried there, and you have survey after survey showing that the vast majority of the black population was sympathetic to Simpson, you don't transfer the case downtown where there's a heavy black population. This was the first manifestation, the tip as it were, of the huge incredible iceberg of incompetence that the prosecution would demonstrate throughout the entire Simpson trial. 
Do you understand the charges against you, sir? Yes, sir. You had an opportunity to discuss those charges with your attorneys? Yes, sir. And are you ready to enter a plea at this time? Yes, sir. How do you plead to counts one and two? Absolutely 100% not guilty. And do you deny each of the... Every time I even think of absolutely 100% not guilty, I want to throw up. Um, it's like I, sometimes I catch myself saying absolutely 100% and I think, oh my God, I can't say that. You know, because it just makes me, it just reminds me so much of that statement because I know that he is 100% guilty. I couldn't believe that he was that, that he went so way over the top. 100% not guilty. Oh, so just a great liar made me sick. That was sure a change from his conversation with uh, Lang on the telephone that, uh, during the uh, Bronco chase. On January 23, 1995, Judge Edel made a ruling that changed the entire complexion of the trial. Although he did not allow the defense in their opening statement to make any reference to witnesses who would testify that Mark Furman used the racial slur nigger, he ruled that he would allow cross-examination on that issue. All right, as to uh, Detective Furman, I'm going to preclude the defense from pursuing that line during the course of opening statements for this reason. Because of the turning over today of other statements made by Kathleen Bell, who is the genesis of this particular issue. However, uh, after the prosecution has had the opportunity to uh, re-interview or re-examine those statements, I will allow cross-examination on that issue. Even if this had been Judge Ito's only flagrant mistake during the trial, this was so devastating to the prosecution that it alone would stand as a condemnation of Ito's judicial performance. The plain fact, however, is that Ito specialized in making patently erroneous rulings, one after another. Let's examine further the one that was his most serious by far. Here are the results of a Newsweek poll which show that only 12% of blacks in America felt that Simpson had been framed by the LAPD because of his race. Note the date, July 25, 1994, just a month and a half after the murders and before the start of the trial. What this poll says then is that nearly 90% of all blacks did not feel that racism was an issue in this case. And the reason they didn't was that it was obvious to virtually everyone that race had nothing to do with this case. There was no racial issue here, only a manufactured one. But after the hiring of Johnny Cochran to replace Robert Shapiro as lead defense attorney, the racial aspect of the case took on new dimensions. Cochran is a man who sees racial overtones in nearly everything, whether they exist or not. And with the bogus fabrication of a race issue and the allegation of a police frame-up, the trial's emphasis, unfortunately, was turned away from the overwhelming proof of Simpson's guilt. How offensive, okay, to the human race to not give them the benefit of the doubt that they would be able to try this case according to the facts and according to the evidence and not have to put in the crap of the racial bias. Okay, that's insulting to people's intelligence. I don't care what color you are, what race you are, what religion you practice, that's insulting. So it was not surprising that a poll near the end of the trial showed that an astonishing 75% of blacks in Los Angeles County actually believed that Simpson was framed. For the most part, the American public has blamed the defense for fraudulently injecting race into the case, and they deserve all the blame that they're getting and then some. But I blame Judge Edel 100% for allowing it to happen. Judge Fujisaki in the civil trial never allowed it to happen. Edel should never have allowed the defense attorneys to ask Mark Furman if he had used the N-word in the previous 10 years. Under Section 352 of the California Evidence Code, if the relevance of offered evidence, here, whether or not Mark Furman had used the N-word, is substantially outweighed by the probability of prejudice to the opposing side, here the prosecution, normally you keep that evidence out. If ever a case existed where the relevance of offered evidence was substantially outweighed by its probability of prejudice to the opposing side, this was it. It wasn't even a close call. Here, the relevance of Furman's using the racial epithet nigger within the previous 10 years was extremely remote, at best, from the issue of whether Simpson was guilty or not guilty of murdering Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. I mean, it's a non sequitur and broad jump of Olympian proportions to conclude that just because Furman used such a racial slur, or even if he were a racist, that he's likely to have framed Simpson for these murders. This proposition all by itself is self-evident. 
what made the relevance of Furman's use of the word nigger even more remote than it already was is the fact that in January of 1995, when Edel ruled that the defense could ask Furman if he had used the epithet in the last 10 years, there was no evidence that he had done so more recently than 1985 or 1986, which was at the outer limits of the 10-year period. Also, a judge, in exercising his discretion under Section 352, does not resolve such an issue as if it existed in a vacuum. He naturally has to view it in the context of the case and the evidence. And here, by the time the cross-examination of Furman began two months later, two LAPD officers had already testified that they had arrived at the murder scene before Furman and saw only one glove there. So even assuming Furman had wanted to frame Simpson by planting one of the murder gloves at Simpson's Rockingham estate, and there isn't one shred of evidence to support this, Edel knew there was no such second glove at the crime scene for Furman to have seized and deposited at Rockingham. It doesn't take a genius to see why the relevance to this case of Furman's use of the racial slur was extremely remote perhaps non-existent, yet the prejudice to the prosecution was more than substantial. It was monumental. After the prosecution has had the opportunity to uh, re-interview or re-examine those statements, I will allow cross-examination on that issue. But with these words, Ito, in an egregiously erroneous ruling which thumbed its nose at Section 352 as well as the law enunciated by the California and U.S. Supreme Courts, open the door for the defense to let race become a central issue at the trial. There was a mountain of evidence pointing to this defendant's guilt. But when you mention that word to this jury or to any African American, it blinds people. It'll blind the jury. It'll blind them to the truth. They won't be able to discern what's true and what's not. It will affect their judgment. It will impair their ability to be fair and impartial. It will cause extreme prejudice to the prosecution's case. Although Darden clearly overstated his case, the jury's hearing that a prosecution witness used the word nigger obviously doesn't automatically guarantee, as he suggested, a not guilty verdict. There can be little question that Edel's permitting the defense to ask Furman whether he had ever used the word in the previous 10 years did, as Darden predicted, change the complexion of the trial. However, as I'll discuss later, if the prosecution had not been so incompetent, they could have substantially mitigated the damage done by Edel's ruling. Even if Edel didn't want to follow the law under Section 352, common sense would have told him that he should not have allowed defense attorneys to ask Furman if he had said the N-word in the previous 10 years. Every single day throughout this country, thousands of white police officers arrest or investigate black suspects. Does anyone really believe that when these thousands upon thousands of cases come to court, it's perfectly proper to ask every one of these officers if they've ever used the N-word in the previous 10 years, and if they deny it, and you can prove that they did, have a separate satellite trial on that issue? which is exactly what happened in the Simpson case? That's crazy. Why would you ask him that? Ask, ask the same blacks if they've ever used the N-word. Ask all the Asians if they've ever used it. I, you know, it's a word in the English language. It's, it's uh, used by people. I, I can't see why we have to equate it to being used solely by whites. Well, first, it's not fair unless we're going to do the same thing with black officers, Latino officers, Oriental officers, female officers. You know, there's a derogatory term to be used for everything that walks the face of the earth. Is it an issue? If it becomes an issue in a trial, then you bring it up. If the defendant makes an allegation that something was said or done to him of racial nature, then you bring it up. If you don't have that, it doesn't come in. This was a case about two people being brutally murdered, is all it was. It was a murder case. It had nothing to do with race. And uh, Ito should have never allowed that in. Would the sexual life of the prosecutor or the defense attorney or any witness in this, would this affect the outcome if O.J. Simpson murdered these two people? Then why could any comment on race affect the outcome of this? It makes no sense. 
another error by Eden. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, as much as I would like to address some of the misrepresentations made about myself and, Mar and Nicole uh, concerning our life together, I'm mindful of the mood and the stamina of this jury. Jury, I have confidence, uh, a lot more it seems than Ms. Clark has, of their integrity and uh, that they will find, as the record stands now, that I did not, could not, and would not have committed this uh, crime. I have four kids, two kids I haven't seen in a year. They ask me every week, Dad, how much longer. All right. I'm just proud of hope. All right. All right. Mr. Simpson, you do understand your right to testify as a witness? Yes, I do. All right. And you choose to rest your I case at this point? This self-serving statement, which a member of the defense team admitted Simpson rehearsed with his lawyers for three weeks, should never have been allowed. The defense team hoped that it would reach the jury by way of conjugal visits, and Judge Ito, who had to know he was being taken, never interrupted Simpson until the very end, when Simpson had just about run out of his rehearsed lines anyway. But while the defense team may have been gloating at getting Simpson's lengthy statement out there, hopefully for the jury's consumption, witness the reaction of Fred Goldman. Ron's father. If he had a statement to make, he should have gotten on the damn stand and said something and not been a coward and been unable to have the prosecution question him. He had a right to say one thing and one thing only, and that was he didn't want to testify. I think the judge expected him only to say that and he shot his mouth off again. One of the more dreadful rulings by Ito may have been responsible for nothing less than depriving the prosecution of either a guilty verdict or an attempt by Simpson to plead guilty to some degree of criminal homicide below first degree murder. Following Simpson's arrest, former NFL defensive lineman Rosie Greer, who had become an ordained minister, became a frequent visitor of Simpson's at the LA County Jail. On November 13, 1994, a Sunday afternoon, a deputy sheriff seated close to where Simpson and Greer were talking to each other by telephone from opposite sides of a three-quarter inch glass partition, heard Simpson blurt out a loud exclamation which the deputy construed as a highly incriminating remark. I was working in the control booth, filling out uh, inmate and jail logs. Uh, part of the responsibilities of a uh, jail officer is to make sure that nothing gets broken in the visiting area and that in turn it means that we need to monitor the actions of the inmates and visitors while they're in that visiting area. At one point in the conversation while I was seated at the desk, uh, I heard O.J. Simpson take the phone and with his arm slam it down onto the counter and causing me to uh, take note of what they were doing. After the exchange occurred, there were a few seconds of silence. Uh, O.J. Simpson uh, looked up toward the ceiling and looked back down toward the ground. It appeared he might be crying. Uh, during this time, Rosie Greer was tapping on the glass trying to get Simpson to pick the phone back up so they could continue their conversation. My gut reaction when I heard the statement by O.J. Simpson was that he was speaking of the murders and that I might have just heard a confession. The deputy wrote out a report for his superiors at the Sheriff's Department, who in turn submitted a report to Judge Ito. The very next day, Ito and representatives of the prosecution and the defense visited the jail area where the alleged incident took place. Later, Ito took testimony from Greer and the deputy outside the presence of the jury on the circumstances surrounding the overheard remark, but not on the remark itself. Although the prosecutors did not know the words of Simpson's statement, they assumed it had to be incriminating. And this is why they argued to Judge Ito that they should hear it and, if they elected to do so, introduce it to the jury at the trial. The defense, naturally, was on its hind legs, trying to keep it out, by arguing that whatever Simpson said, it was confidential and entitled to legal protection. The main legal issue was whether Simpson's remark was protected by the clergyman penitent privilege, one of many privileged communications, such as the attorney-client, doctor-patient, or husband-wife privileges, which are designed by the law to protect personal relationships where the protection of confidentiality from a public policy standpoint, is thought to be more important than the need for the communication to be received into evidence. But the holder of the privilege, in this case Simpson, can quote, waive the privilege, which usually occurs when he makes the statement in the known presence of a third party not necessary to the communication. I believe that uh, on the date in question, Simpson had a very good idea that there was at least an officer in the booth. From where O.J. Simpson was seated to where I was seated is approximately six feet uh, the distance between Rosie Greer and O.J. is about three, so the distance between Rosie and I 
was probably about three feet. Simpson would know there was someone in there, not only by the fluorescent lights that were in the control booth, but additionally the fluorescent lights that were over the elevator uh, area. Uh, if he couldn't see us in particular or make out who it was, he'd at least be able to see a silhouette. So this was an obvious case of waiver. Since Simpson shouted out his statement, knowing the deputy sheriff was only a few feet away, but on December 19th, Judge Ito gave another of his improper rulings, disallowing the prosecution from using the guard's testimony. Ito ruled that Simpson had waived the privilege, but remarkably kept Simpson's statement out on a totally non-legal ground, stating, quote, Consul for Simpson now argue that Simpson was lulled into a false sense of security in regard to the confidentiality of his communications in the visiting area. The argument is well taken, unquote. The only problem was that if there was a waiver, as Ito literally had to rule there was, there was no legal basis for excluding the statement. If one were to accept Ito's non-legal justification for excluding the statement, I guess it would have made any difference how loudly or how often Simpson shouted out his confession or incriminating statement. It would be inadmissible because he had been, quote, lulled into a false sense of security. So what had Simpson allegedly said? To this day, this report from the sheriff's office to Judge Ito remains sealed by the court. I heard O.J. Simpson take the phone, slam it down on the counter, and then yell out, I didn't mean to do it, I'm sorry. And at a moment or so later, Rosie Greer, who now could not communicate with Simpson over the phone because Simpson no longer had the phone to his ear, yelled back to O.J. saying, O.J., you've got to come clean, you've got to tell somebody. Simpson, of course, had told Greer what we already knew. With that extremely incriminating statement before the jury, Simpson would have had three choices, none of which would have been good for him. He could have either tried to, number one, plea bargain, or two, take the witness stand, which he was trying to avoid at all costs, and deny that he made the statement. But if Greer, who reportedly never visited Simpson again after this incident, confirmed the deputy's statement, which we don't know that he would have done, then Simpson's denial would not have been plausible. It should be noted that Deputy Stewart would have had to be crazy to testify under oath and penalty of perjury that Simpson made the statement if he knew Simpson hadn't, and Greer would confirm this fact. Simpson's third choice would have been to take the stand and admit that yes, he did in fact make the statement, but that it was misunderstood. That when he said, I didn't mean to do it, I'm sorry, to Greer, he was actually referring to eating another inmate's helping of dessert. I'm being facetious, of course. But whatever misinterpretation he claimed took place over what he said, he need the testimony of Greer to corroborate the fact that they were talking about something other than the murders of Nicole and Ron. However it played out, it would have been exceedingly damaging, perhaps fatal, to Simpson. But Judge Ito, in his inimitable fashion, made another bad ruling, this one of pivotal and momentous consequences. Although Ito was a conscientious, intelligent, and fair-minded jurist, some of the things Ito did during the trial I can only characterize as irrational, almost goofy. For instance, during the early part of the trial, several jurors were excused for various reasons and replaced by alternate jurors. There was a frequently expressed fear that the case might run out of alternate jurors, and if one of the remaining 12 regular jurors was excused for any reason thereafter, only 11 would be left, and without the consent of both sides, there would be a mistrial. Right in the midst of all this, Ito decided to give the jurors a ride in the Goodyear blimp. Yeah, you heard me right, a blimp ride. A few days later, the blimp had an accident attempting to take off with a load of passengers. The LA Times said, quote, with Ito's luck, he must feel fortunate there were no jurors aboard that day. Also incredibly, Ito planned to take a mini vacation right in the middle of closing arguments since he had scheduled it before he was assigned to the case, and come hell or high water, he wasn't about to postpone it even for a week or so. Mounting pressure from all sides forced him to change his mind. But the fact that he was even considering it made me think that the good judge may have been keeping time to a different drummer. What I saw in Ito was a judge who frequently had a touch of a tough guy sneer on his face and a virtually constant intimidating tone to his voice. The tone was not as pronounced as it is with so many judges, but there was an unmistakable edge to his voice and his words that always implied the lawyers were in imminent danger of being held in contempt of court or sanctioned. Marcia Clark was fine, for example, when she was a few minutes late for an early morning court session outside the presence of the jury. She immediately apologized and explained the reason for her tardiness. Ito, unimpressed, at first fined the DA's office $250.
Can I remind the court that Mr. Shapiro kept the court waiting for 20 minutes, showing up at 20 after 9 when it was his witness on the stand and suffered no sanction? Thank sure. you. Sanction will be $1,000. The judge also fined Cochran $1,000 during the trial. Ito was a rather thin-skinned judge who was offended by the slightest transgression, real or perceived. Okay, you say? So we have a testy judge. So what? Well, here's where the problem comes in. A lawyer must have credibility in the eyes of the jury. That's an absolute. But one of the ways a lawyer can lose his credibility with the jury is when the judge demeans the lawyer in court and the lawyer lets him get away with it. For instance, on several occasions, Judge Ito crisply told Miss Clark, right in front of the jury, sit down, as if he were talking to a child. Clark always complied immediately, without a whimper. Nothing can be worse for a prosecutor than to lose stature in the jury's eyes. Another example, at one point in the trial, Marsha Clark used the word matched, which Ito had disallowed. In your examination of the hairs collected from the evidence in this case, sir, uh, did you find any hairs that match those of Nicole Brown? Sustained. Strike. With the court reporter, please. After sustaining the objection, Judge Ito called a sidebar and proceeded to tell Marsha Clark she was flirting with contempt. And despite the fact that she denied saying the word matched intentionally, Ito threatened to put her in jail over the weekend if she said it again. This remark by Ito although outside the presence of the jury, was all over the news for the jurors' spouses and loved ones to hear and possibly pass on to them during their next conjugal visit. You can imagine how it would sound for a juror to hear, the judge almost put Marsha Clark in jail a few days ago for something she did. Before I tell you what I think the prosecutors should have said to Judge Ito, given his treatment of them, let me say a few words about judges. The appointment of judges to the bench has always been part and parcel of the political spoils or patronage system, and that appointment is to a great extent the result of one's political activity. Either the appointee has personally labored long and hard in the political vineyards, or he's the favored friend of one who has. Now, the American people have an understandably negative view of politicians. Public opinion polls show that. They also have an equally negative view of lawyers. Conventional logic would seem to dictate then that since a judge is both a politician and a lawyer, people would have an opinion of them lower than a grasshopper's belly. But on the contrary, a $25 black cotton robe elevates the denigrated lawyer politician to a position of considerable honor and respect in our society, as if the garment itself miraculously imbued the wearer with qualities not previously possessed. In almost all forms of popular entertainment, judges are nearly always depicted as learned men and women of stature and solemnity, as impartial as sunlight. Sadly, this depiction often defies reality, although I must say there are many fine judges. While Judge Edel did not go so far as to humiliate the prosecutors, I do feel that he was sufficiently disrespectful that when they stood up to give their final summations, they had little stature with the jurors. So how could that have been avoided? Immediately after the first sharp and abusive sit-down to her from Ito, Marsha Clark should have asked for a recess. Then, back in chambers, Ito should have been told, first in a very civil way, but if this was unavailing, much more assertively, that although he had the right to speak, if he chose, in a condescending way to the prosecutors outside the presence of the jury, he did not have the right to hurt the prosecutor's clients, the people of the state of California, in any way whatsoever in front of the jury. And they had an obligation to ensure that he did not. Therefore, if he had anything negative to say to them, it had to be said outside the presence of the jury. In front of the jury, he had to show them the same identical respect they showed him. Nothing more, nothing less. If necessary, Ito should also have been reminded that although he was an extremely important person at the trial, it was they, not he, who represented the people of the state of California. Finally, and most importantly, he'd have to be told in so many words that if he did not treat the prosecutors with the same respect they showed for him, he himself would have to pay a price right in front of the jury and the millions of people watching the trial. Ito, who was so very concerned about his public image, would not have wanted to be demeaned before millions of people. Now, what if the prosecutors had stood up to Ito in front of the jury and Ito responded by holding them in contempt? Big deal. 
They could have handled any fine or sanction. But most important, I assure you, that the prosecutors would have not only retained, but perhaps even elevated their stature, and hence credibility, in the eyes of the jury. However, the prosecutors in this case had bigger problems than their lack of credibility with the jury. Their prosecution of O.J. Simpson was the most incompetent criminal prosecution I have ever seen, by far. There have undoubtedly been worse. It's just that I'm not aware of any. Let me point out to anyone who might think that this has been Monday morning quarterbacking on my part that they are wrong. I talked about most of these things long before the verdict. Just for example, over three months before the verdict, as the prosecution was nearing the end of their presentation without having introduced certain key pieces of evidence, I was quoted as saying, I'm stunned. I'm aware of some very incriminating evidence they have and didn't use. And when you prosecute a case, you put on everything you have. And when the prosecutors finally rested their case without introducing Simpson's tape-recorded statement, suicide note, passport, etc., I made the same comments in the July 8th edition of the New York Times. It should also be noted that throughout the trial, I remained hopeful of a guilty verdict, was very supportive of the prosecutors, and didn't want to upset them psychologically with verbal assaults upon their competence. However, there were times on radio and TV when I did lament the fact that the prosecutors were not doing a better job. On more than one TV and radio show, I observed that the prosecution could be doing, quote, a much, much better job than they were. And on this week with David Brinkley, I said, with regard to the prosecutor's upcoming final summation, I certainly hope they're up to it. I'm not as confident in them now as I was at the beginning of the case. As it turned out, their final summation was considerably worse than I could have ever imagined it to be. In fact, like the calm before a storm, long before the trial started, I had a sense that there might be a serious problem with the prosecution. They didn't seem to be taking charge of the case. The moment a decision is made to bring felony charges, the DA has to make all important decisions having an impact on the case. But this wasn't done here. And I want emergency Can you get someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back. Please. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. He just <laughs> drove up. Over. Okay, wait a minute. What kind of car is he in? He's in a white Bronco. But first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. Okay, has he threatened you in any way? Or, or is he just harassing you? <sighs> You're going to hear him in a minute. He's about to come in again. Okay, just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. He's going to beat the shit out of me. Most of us have heard this tape. Poor Nicole, in fear of her life, from a man who beat her in the past, and now seemed on the verge of doing it again. When the LAPD properly called the DA's office for guidance on whether or not to release the October 25, 1993 911 tape to the media, which was clamoring for it, remarkably, the DA's office told them to follow the advice of the LA City Attorney's Office, which had absolutely nothing to do with the prosecution of this case. The city attorney's office, with no statutory authority or case law requiring them to do so, unfortunately told the police to release the tape. It saturated the news, resulting in the grand jury proceedings being aborted by the presiding judge of the LA County Superior Court because members of the grand jury had heard it. For the attorneys to look at a person and say, well, gee, they talk to the media so they don't have any credibility left, I think that's wrong. And I think Marcia made a big mistake by not using a woman named Jill Shively in this case. Jill Shively called me uh, within uh, two or three days of the murder. I answered the phone. She didn't call me personally. I answered the phone. And uh, she started telling me uh, who she was and where she lived and that she had been going to a market at the corner of San Vicente and Bundy that evening and that she had to get there by 11 o'clock because it closed at 11 and she said that as she was proceeding uh, east on San Vicente into the intersection of Bundy a vehicle in front of her that a white sports utility vehicle ran through the red light going north on Bundy almost hit the vehicle in front of her the two drivers exchanged words and she was behind and had stopped and looked and saw that the driver of the white sports utility vehicle was O.J. Simpson. That he had ran the red light going north on uh, Bundy there at uh, San Vicente. And she just had too many particulars for it not to be true. But she spoke with the media and she didn't tell us about speaking with the media. 
and uh, consequently she was not used as a uh, witness in the case. Before I get into the virtually continuous incompetence of the prosecution throughout the trial, their failure to aggressively counter transparently idiotic defense theories, their very anemic final summation, etc., I want to talk about what is by far the worst part of their performance, something that goes beyond incompetence. It's one thing to mess up the evidence you present or to present it in a less than forceful manner so that its impact was less than you had hoped for. However, it's quite another thing to not present the evidence at all. That is unforgivable. Yet that's exactly what the prosecution did in this case. In all my years in the criminal law, I've never seen another case, never even heard of another case, where the prosecution decided not to introduce a tremendous amount of very incriminating evidence against a defendant. I mean, that's what a prosecutor does in a criminal trial, present incriminating evidence. Let's talk about some of the main pieces of evidence the prosecution didn't introduce in this case. And then I'll tell you the principal reason why they said they didn't offer it. When I do, it'll be best if you're sitting down, because it could literally affect your physical equilibrium. First, the suicide note. If Simpson were innocent, it seems he would have been outraged that he was being accused of murders that he did not commit, desperately want to prove his innocence, find out who murdered the mother of his two children. No, he doesn't do any of these things. Instead, he becomes very passive and writes a to whom it may concern letter that reads exactly like a suicide note and refers to himself as a, quote, lost person. Show me an innocent person charged with murder who would write a note like that. This letter was written by O.J. today. To whom it may concern. First, everyone understand I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. I loved her, always have, and always will. If we had a problem, it's because I, love her. I loved her so much. Recently, we came to the understanding that for now, we were not right for each other, at least for now. Despite our love, we were different, and that's why we mutually agreed to go our separate ways. It was tough splitting for a second time but we both knew it was for the best. Inside, I had no doubt that in the future we would be close friends or more. Unlike what has been written in the press, Nicole and I had a great relationship for most of our lives together. Like all long-term relationships, we had a few downs and ups. I took the heat New Year's 1989 because that's what I was supposed to do. I did not plead no contest for any other reason but to protect our privacy and was advised it would end the press hype. I don't want to be labor knocking the press but I can't believe what is being said. Most of it is totally made up. I know you have a job to do, but as a last wish, please, please, please leave my children in peace. Their lives will be tough enough. Paula, what can I say? You are special. I'm sorry I'm not going to have we're not going to have our chance. God brought you to me, I now see. As I leave, you'll be in my thoughts. I think of my life and feel I've done most of the right things. So why do I end up like this? I can't go on. No matter what the outcome, people will look and point. I can't take that. I can't subject my children to that. This way they can move on and go on with their lives. Please, if I've done anything worthwhile in my life, let my kids live in peace from you, the press. I've had a good life. I'm proud of how I lived, 
my mama taught me to do unto others. I treated people the way I wanted to be treated. I've always tried to be up and helpful. So why is this happening? I'm sorry for the Goldman family. I know how much it hurts. Nicole and I had a good life together. All this press talk about a rocky relationship was no more than that, than, I'm sorry, was no more than what every long-term relationship experiences. All her friends will confirm that I have been totally loving and understanding of what she's been going through. At times, I have felt like a battered husband or boyfriend, but I loved her. Make that clear to everyone, and I would take whatever it took to make it work. Don't feel sorry for me. I've had a great life, great friends. Please think of the real OJ and not this lost person. Thanks for making my life special. I hope I helped yours. Peace and love, OJ. For those who cling tenaciously to Simpson's innocence and argue that the reason he wanted to commit suicide is that he couldn't live without Nicole, consider that Simpson has got to be one of the most self-absorbed persons that there could ever be. One whose narcissism is of jumbo proportions and he gives no indication of being the type of person who would kill himself over the loss of another human being. No, he was not killing himself. It, you know, when, when he was, when they were announcing it, I was listening to it and watching the helicopters, because I was right there in Brentwood at the time, and thinking, and they were saying, oh, O.J. Simpson's gonna, going to kill himself. I'm, I'm, uh, don't you guys know he can't kill himself? He loves himself too, mu too much. He can't do it. Actually, S Simpson's quote-unquote suicide note was more of a uh, more of a cop-out type note uh, he never mentioned anything about hurting himself he, he he didn't intend on hurting himself at all this guy people that people that have an ego like Simpson has doesn't hurt themselves people that hurt themselves are people with low self-esteem people that are extremely depressed and have problems this guy would never exhibited those symptoms at all he he uh, he's a very egotistical man that uh, that uh, that's in love with himself. He never intended on hurting himself. Suspects commit suicide because they're going to be caught and they can't deal with the results of that. Bereaved husbands don't kill themselves because their loved one is dead and leave two children without another parent. This was an admission of guilt. It's all about Simpson. Everybody else is, you know, uh, pawns on a chessboard to be moved around so that he can get to the position that he wants. Um, he is, he's the quintessential narcissist. This is something that I told Marcia and she never used either. I mean, we had, he tried to, in, I mean, not as far as a beard or a mustache or anything like that, but he g went to the point of even going to putting on a visor, putting on these big, huge glasses, uh, wrapping his hand up so we wouldn't have to sign autographs when we went to Disneyland and you know not really talking to anybody but kind of keeping his head down and nobody really recognized him which was really kind of you know it was good because we were able to walk through Disneyland then all of a sudden it was as if he hated the fact that he wasn't approached and he started becoming loud, his voice got really loud, and he needed to be seen. He took the, uh, the bandage off of his arm, like everything was okay, and all of a sudden people realized who it was, that it was O.J. Simpson, and people started coming over and uh, asking for autographs. And at that point on, he was a happy person. But until that point, when nobody recognized him, he was just the biggest downer in the world. He was just so, like, like he needed that to fuel his being. He needed people to fuel his ego. And I just thought it was really amazing. I thought it was so funny that this man just couldn't be with his family and going to Disneyland and having a good time without the recognition of any public person. 
The argument that Simpson couldn't live without Nicole would be diametrically opposed to an integral element of Simpson's defense to these murders, that he was over Nicole, had started a life without her, and therefore had no motive to kill her. And they had been going together since they were 18 years old. He had a total control of her life. Well, total control of her life, I didn't think it was a bad thing. I mean, he, he, he got her, he molded her sort of in a way that he wanted to have somebody who he wanted to be with. And being 18 years old, I think you, you're very vulnerable to the fact that, okay, well, this is the man that I love, and this is the person that I want to be with for the rest of my life, and this is the person that I want to please. Well, he, you know, sometimes people take it to a, more of an extreme where it becomes obsessive and this is a possession of mine rather than loving that person and respecting that person and treating them like an equal and uh, you know doing things together and working th working things out together but he was always above her always on that pedestal above her and then when you have somebody who is so possessive and so obsessed with someone that when they lose all that control they flip out and that's what happened when Nicole finally left the situation he totally flipped out he totally lost control and if the reason Simpson wanted to die was that he couldn't live without Nicole, what conceivable reason would he have had for not saying this in his farewell letter? Nowhere does he say or even imply in the letter that Nicole's death is why he wants to end his life. In fact, in the letter, he says that God had brought his then current girlfriend, Paula Barbieri, to him. And he tells her how sorry he is that they will not have their chance. Yet this note which points irresistibly in the direction of Simpson's guilt, was never seen by the jury because the prosecutors chose not to introduce it into evidence. But it gets worse. The Los Angeles Police Department right now is actively searching for Mr. Simpson. We will continue our pursuit of Mr. Simpson and hope to have him in custody soon. Yeah. Just let me get to my house. Please. Okay, we're going to do that. I swear to you, I'll give you what I, I'll you, give you me. I'll give you my whole body. Uh, okay. I just need to get to my house. Okay. Where okay. I live with Nicole. We're going to do that. Just throw the gun out the window. I can't do that. Please, you're scaring us. You're scaring them. Please, man. Hey, you've been a good guy, too, man. Let Thanks, you, I know you're doing your job. You were I appreciate you that. Right from the beginning, just saying you're doing your job. Listen. I know you do a good job. Okay, thank you. But there's a lot of people that love you. Don't throw it all uh, away. Don't throw it all away. Oh, uh, I can't take this. You, you're scaring everybody, though. You're scaring uh, them. Just tell them I'm all sorry. You can tell them later on the day and tomorrow that I was sorry. and that I, I'm sorry that I did this to the police department. Why would an innocent man make the statements that he made during these tapes? It was almost, you got me, it's over, and, and I, I feel terrible about this. I mean, it was, it was a no-brainer, but I couldn't help but think in the back of my mind, is it, has this been orchestrated? I still, I still wonder. After the slow speed chase of Simpson and his friend Al Cowlings and Cowlings Bronco, the police found in Simpson's possession a gun, his passport, a cheap disguise, and several fresh changes of underwear. When Cowlings was told to empty his pockets, he pulled out $8,750 in currency, which he proceeded to tell the police Simpson had given him inside the Bronco. These items, of course, had guilt written all over them. They were hardly your normal carry-alongs for a quick trip to visit Nicole at the cemetery, Simpson's purported destination that day. People think that O.J. Simpson was going to the gravesite. He was not going to the gravesite. He was escaping. I think he was going to Mexico. And I think he was trying to do it by going to the Ontario um, airport taking a friend's private jet. After Cowlings was arrested, uh, I interviewed him in the interview room there at the robbery homicide. I asked him at the end of the interview, I said, uh, Al, I just want to ask you one question. Do you think O.J. killed him? And uh, he looked at me and he says, you've got a lot of evidence, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. And he says, well, I think it speaks for itself. And uh, I think that said it all right there. The passport alone is very incriminating evidence of guilt. I mean, why would Simpson have his passport on him if he weren't thinking of escaping? And why would he be thinking of escaping if he were innocent? But again, unbelievably, the prosecution never presented the evidence of the slow speed chase to the jury, nor the extremely incriminating evidence found in the Bronco after the chase. When you offer evidence like the suicide note, passport, cash, disguise, etc., you're offering something that even the simplest of lay people can understand. It's the type of evidence upon which they have formed opinions throughout their lives. For instance, running away from anything, 
be it adults running from the scene of a liquor store robbery or children running away from a neighbor's broken window, is automatically associated by all humans with a guilty state of mind. And the passport, cash, and disguise, of course, fall into that category. These conventional pieces of evidence have been the basis for hundreds of thousands of criminal convictions throughout the years. I always wanted to be able to, to confront him face to face and ask him if you need uh, a disguise, a passport, your Hall of Fame ring, changes of underwear, and approximately $10,000 in cash to go down to Orange County and visit your ex-wife's grave. When he makes those statements, uh, you know, at the time, I, I didn't internalize them, but obviously later on we, uh, we hear those statements and you begin to wonder, why would he say these things? And I'm saying to myself, boy, this is going to be great at trial. The uh, jury's going to eat this stuff up. Of course, we never heard that at trial. I was like, what, do we, what was he running from? If he was so innocent, what was he running from? He said he wanted to go down and be with Nicole. So what was he going to do, kill himself at Nicole's grave? I don't think so. I think he was too chicken. He liked himself too much. His ego was too big in order to let something like that happen. I believe the guy was running for his life. Probably one of the, the, the items that I was astounded once I learned existed was the, the, da the dated receipt about the disguise that was in the Bronco after the car chase. Uh, I, when I realized that it was not just the disguise, along with all the other things, but that the disguise had been purchased a week or so before uh, the murders, uh, to me that would have either forced them to testify or forced them not to testify and had that sinister interpretation right there for the jury to, to see. DNA evidence, on the other hand, is totally foreign and alien to a jury. Let us assume that there is cross-contamination with sample 52 from a reference sample or from another swatch containing Mr. Simpson's blood that had a high DNA content. Okay. And let us further assume that the starting material on swatch number 52 had DNA that was degraded. Okay. Would not a result, assuming that 1.3 dot is a real dot, not an artifact. Are you okay. with me? Okay. Would not the reading on this strip be consistent with that set of assumptions. You understand the factors involved in the question? I, I think I understand the first about half of it, and then I kind of lost it on the second half. And this is obviously the, not to suggest that the DNA evidence should not have been presented. Although the prosecution piled complex DNA evidence upon more DNA evidence instead of condensing its presentation and simplifying it for the jury. But under no circumstances should it have been presented to the exclusion of so much conventional evidence that was available to the prosecution in this case. With conventional evidence, like the slow speed chase that the prosecution had, there is rarely a legitimate answer other than guilt. And if the fleeing party attempts an innocent explanation, the words almost invariably sound fabricated and silly and can be shown and demonstrated to be totally unworthy of belief in court. The Bronco chase happened in full view of everyone including, we can be sure, each of the 12 jurors. You'd have had to be in the deepest reaches of the Amazon to maybe have not heard of this. Don't you think the jurors thought it a little odd they weren't given this evidence, as if maybe the prosecution was hiding something? Most unbelievably, more so than the suicide note, gun, passport, cash, and disguise evidence put together, the prosecutors never introduced into evidence the extremely incriminating statement Simpson made to the police on the day after the murders. I mean, this is beyond belief. An interview is basically investigatory in nature. When you interview a potential suspect, you are attempting to glean inconsistencies. You're still in the investigative stage. You don't have that hard coal evidence. And you don't, in an interview, the whole point is to get a person talking, to get them to talk. So you don't start yelling and screaming at them. You don't start slapping tables because you want them to talk. And when you start yelling and screaming and slapping tables, people 
pretend not to say anything. We were attempting to get Simpson to talk, which we did. Uh, we were still investigating. We knew we had a blood trail, but, but we didn't know for a fact that it was Simpson's blood. It could, what, it could have been someone else's blood. We didn't know. This was an interview. Conversely, an interrogation is confrontational. You confront the potential suspect with direct evidence. Here we had a bloody hand, we had blood at the scene, and we had a very narcissistic, self-absorbed individual who had been advised of his constitutional rights and knew he didn't have to be there. He was going to remain there as long as he felt he controlled the situation. You become confrontational. You go good cop, bad cop. You get in his face, you're going to lose him, he's going to walk. We got more information out of this guy in 32 minutes than all of the attorneys did in deposition and him on the stand for days two years later after all the evidence was known. He just lied to them, yet we got all of these inconsistent statements. He just didn't get his story straight. That also went to alibi. We had two or three different alibis during that interview that to this day he hasn't been able to resolve. Although detectives Lang and Van Adder saw it differently, the 32-minute interview could have been longer and it could have been more penetrating. By that I mean Simpson was not pinned down in some areas as precisely as he should have been, some good follow-up questions were not asked, and the interrogation probably should not have been terminated until either Simpson called it quits or his celebrity lawyer came back from the lunch he was having and said no more. But even with all that, Detectives Lang and Van Adder did succeed in getting enough out of Simpson to convict him out of his own mouth alone. Since Simpson's left middle finger was bandaged at the time of the interview, they asked him, how did you get the injury on your hand? To which he responded, I don't know. He then proceeded to say that the first time he cut his finger was in Chicago, but then immediately added words that suggested he had first cut himself the previous night, the night of the murders. The exchange went like this. How did you get the injury on your hand? I don't know. Well, not the first time. I know I bet when I was in Chicago, I know how, but at the house I was just running around. And was... A little later, this exchange occurred. Do you recall bleeding at all in the, in the truck in the Bronco? I recall bleeding at my house, and then I went to, went to the Bronco. The last thing I did before I left, when I was rushing, was went and got my phone out of the Bronco. Note the phrasing. I recall bleeding at my house, and then I went to the Bronco. So Simpson was already bleeding at the time he went to his Bronco to get his phone. So much for the propaganda that the defense floated for the media and the American public that Simpson told the detectives he cut himself on his cellular phone. By the way, has anyone ever seen a cellular phone with edges so sharp that you cut yourself? You see, this is what I meant about the difficulty of trying to explain away guilt. And a little later, this exchange occurred. Do you recall bleeding at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew I was bleeding, but it was no big deal. I bleed all the time. I mean, it's, I'm always, I play golf and stuff, so yeah. there's always something mixed and stuff here. And there. Now, no one, not even a hemophiliac, bleeds all the time. Not only isn't Simpson a hemophiliac, but nicks don't cause you to bleed all over your car, your home, and the driveway of your home. Moreover, the cut to Simpson's left hand was not a nick. It was a deep cut to the knuckle of his left middle finger, and in fact was heavily bandaged at the time of the interview. As far as Simpson's explanation, I play golf and stuff, I'm not a golfer, but the producer of this show has been playing golf for 36 years, probably a lot longer than Simpson. And he tells me there is nothing intrinsic to the game of golf that induces or makes one susceptible to bleeding. Blisters, perhaps, but that's why you wear gloves. Bleeding? No. Perhaps the bleeding came from the quote, and stuff, part of Simpson's explanation. And stuff being murdering two people with a knife. Now, lest there be any confusion in anyone's mind, that Simpson admitted cutting himself the night of the murders before he allegedly cut himself in Chicago. There is this portion of the interview. We've got uh, some blood on and in your car. We've got some blood at your house. And uh, sort of a problem. Well, we take more blood. Well, we, we'd like yeah. to do yeah. that. Uh, we've got, of course, the cut on your finger that you don't, aren't real clear on. Uh, do you Can't be as clear as I am. Okay. Yeah. Do you recall having that cut on your finger the last time you were at the Poles house? 
A week ago? Yeah. No. Oh, so it's been no, since. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this last night. Okay. So somewhere, somewhere yeah. last night you got. Yeah. Uh. Somewhere after the uh, recital. Somewhere when I was rushing to get out of my house. After, okay. Yeah. After yeah. the yeah. after the uh, yeah. recital. Yeah. The detectives also told Simpson that in addition to the blood in his car and home, they also found blood on the driveway of his home. Well, there's blood at your house in the driveway, yeah. and that uh, footstep, we've got a search warrant, and we're going to go and get the blood. Yeah. Uh, we found some in your house. Yeah. Is that your blood that's dripped there? If, if it's dripped, it's what I dripped running around trying to leave. Last night. Yeah. yeah. That's very incriminating. I mean, how is he going to explain that? He couldn't. There was no question in my mind that this is good stuff. They're going to use this. Let's, you know, get the blood now. Let's move on with it. Uh, he said he's bled. Now that kind of gave us an, an end to getting his blood. It all, it all fit together. That was very incriminating. Everything he said uh, was either incriminating or an inconsistent statement. It could be in, indicative that he's just not telling us the truth. Mr. Cochran doesn't have very, very good ethics in a courtroom. Um, to, to blatantly try to change what the truth is. I mean, not even shade it, but change it. Uh, to know that Simpson was cut, to know that Simpson admitted that he was cut, to know that he admitted that the blood in the driveway in the Bronco was his, and then try to convince a jury that it isn't. Uh, you know, that says a lot for the ethics. None. No ethics whatsoever. So what we have then, from Simpson's own lips, he admits dripping blood in his car and home on the night of the murders. And when they asked him how he got the cut to his left middle finger that caused all the bleeding, he answered, I don't know. That ridiculous statement alone and all by itself shows an obvious consciousness of guilt. But much more importantly, what is the statistical probability of Simpson innocently cutting himself very badly on his left middle finger around the very same time his former wife is brutally murdered? One in 10 million, one in a million. And even if we make that extravagant assumption, if you do cut yourself, you stop the bleeding with your hand or a handkerchief and you put on a bandage. You don't bleed all over the place. Unless, of course, you're in a frantic, frenzied state, as Simpson obviously was. I've never talked to anybody that cut themselves just 12 hours before that couldn't figure out when they cut themselves, where and where they went, and how they stopped the bleeding and actually how it occurred, especially a very significant cut on your hand. To anyone listening to Simpson's voice on the 32-minute audio, he comes across as having a guilty mind. He's somewhat hesitant, halting, and uneasy in his answers. This lack of spontaneity suggests he was thinking about what was the best answer for him to give. He was also contradictory. For instance, he gave three different answers as to when he last drove his Bronco. Additionally, there's no indication in his voice or words that he is grieving over what happened to Nicole or even shocked by what happened. But most noticeably, there's a total absence of outrage and resentment or even surprise on his part that he's being considered a suspect in these murders. In short, Simpson's demeanor during the interview is consistent with and fortifies all the other evidence pointing unerringly to his guilt. This 32-minute interview in which Simpson admits dripping blood on the night of the murders and says he has no idea how he got cut, could hardly have been a more powerful and incriminating piece of evidence for the prosecution to introduce to the jury. You give me a yellow pad in 100 hours, and I would have convicted Simpson on this one statement alone. Yet incredibly, the jury never heard this statement because the prosecutors never introduced it into evidence. So why didn't the jury hear all of this evidence? The suicide note, the Bronco chase, the 32-minute interrogation, the prosecutors have given several reasons for not introducing this evidence, but here's the main reason they've given. In the suicide note, Simpson denied guilt. Big deal. Who expected him to confess? If you go up to San Quentin, all the inmates will tell you that they're not guilty. They all denied guilt. It doesn't mean anything. During the slow speed chase, Simpson was on his cellular phone, talking to his mother and his friends, protesting his innocence and denying guilt. In the 32 minute interview, he doesn't expressly deny guilt, but it's implicit in everything he says that he's denying guilt. And here's what the prosecutors have said. I'm not making this up. You can't make up stuff like this. It's just too far out. They said, we didn't offer all this evidence because we didn't want the jury to hear Simpson denying guilt without his taking the witness stand. But the jury already knew that Simpson had denied guilt. I said earlier that they weren't particularly bright, but they knew he had pled not guilty. 
That's why they were there. That's why they were having a trial for Pete's sake. If he had pled guilty, there wouldn't have been a trial. You don't keep out a tremendous amount of incriminating evidence just to prevent the jury from hearing something that they obviously already know. This is nothing short of mind-boggling. Incompetent would be too flattering a word for this type of conduct. Incompetence implies conduct within the normal range of human behavior. This is beyond incompetence. It's unheard of, perhaps unprecedented. For those of you who think I'm making this up, let me read to you what Prosecutor Christopher Darden wrote in his book, In Contempt, and I quote, I would have loved to introduce Simpson's interview with Detectives Lang and Van Adder, but that would have allowed him to deny his guilt without having to testify. Unbelievable. To these prosecutors, Simpson's admitting dripping blood in his car, home, and driveway on the night of the murders and claiming he has no idea how he got cut were overridden by the fact that he denied committing these murders. This is the mentality of the prosecution team that was representing the state in the case of people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson. And people wonder why a brutal murderer walked out the courtroom door with a smile on his face and is now playing golf? There's another fundamental problem with the prosecution's not having introduced the 32-minute interrogation, one that clearly showed me that these prosecutors knew very little about prosecuting a criminal case. The jury knew Simpson had made a statement. On direct examination of Lang and Van Adder before the jury, the prosecutors elicited the information that the detectives had interviewed Simpson. But then the prosecutors went on to other matters. At that point, the jurors naturally wondered two things. One, they wondered what Simpson had told the police, and two, they undoubtedly wondered why the DA wasn't offering the statement into evidence for their consideration. This couldn't possibly have been good for the prosecution in the jury's eyes. And as if that weren't bad enough, on cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses, whenever the defense alluded to the statement in any of its questions, Clark or another prosecutor would stand up in front of the jury and vigorously object to any reference to the statement. That looked absolutely terrible and has to have hurt the prosecution's credibility in the jury's eyes. The jurors have to have asked themselves why the prosecution wanted to prevent them from hearing what Simpson had said. Above all, and I know they say there are exceptions to every rule, but this rule has no exceptions. And if there are any budding prosecutors out there, they can write down and laminate what I'm about to say and carry it in their wallets. The prosecution should always convey to the jury that as representatives of the people, they want to present all relevant evidence on the issue of guilt. They should never be put in a position before the jury of trying to suppress relevant evidence. It's for the defense to try to suppress evidence, not the prosecution. How is it possible the prosecutors in this case apparently did not know this? So the statement Simpson gave the police, which by itself was enough to convict him, not only wasn't used by the prosecutors to help their case, but it actually hurt them. With the prosecution's decision not to offer the suicide note, all the incriminating evidence found in the Bronco, and above all, Simpson's self-incriminating statement, how could Marcia Clark even begin to think she had any justification for making this statement to the jury? You have the assurance of knowing that no stone has been left unturned. The defense has explored every nook and cranny of the case. We have exhaustively tried to give you every piece of information that could possibly be relevant to answer the question we're here to answer. You exhaustively tried to give them every piece of evidence, Marcia? The suicide note, the passport, the disguise, the gun, Simpson bleeding on the night of the murders and not knowing how he got cut? This is evidence that had no relevance at all to the question that the jury was there to answer? All of this evidence, of course, was offered by plaintiff's attorneys Daniel Petricelli and John Kelly in the successful wrongful death civil lawsuit against Simpson. Show me anyone, anyone out in the street, who wouldn't offer this evidence. Absolutely unbelievable. Listen to the story of one of the prosecution's original witnesses, Robert Heitstra, a man who did testify at the criminal trial, but as a witness for the defense. Mr. Heistra, uh, you know, we interviewed him. We talked with him uh, real quickly after the case. And uh, the evening of the murder, he was walking down the alley directly east of where the murder occurred, walking his dog. And uh, he, he's directly east of the crime scene. He hears what he describes to us as a Caucasian voice in a real excited manner yell, Hey, 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 like something's occurring. And then he hears what he describes as an African-American voice. 
mumble something back as if there's an altercation going on. And then he says he continues walking south in the alley, and when he gets to the mouth of the alley at Dorothy Street, he sees a white sports utility vehicle like a Bronco or a Blazer come flying out of the back alley there behind Bundy. Uh, and he gives us an exact time, 10.35 in the evening. Heidstra's testimony, I believe, was credible. Uh, you saw him very effectively used in the civil case. But Heidstra had a personality conflict with Chris Darden. And when it was over, I mean, it came to shouting. They didn't use him. I hate to think that Ego got in the way. I really would. He goes out and he tells three, three or four, three that I know of, that I interviewed people, that, hey, I heard this and... The prosecutor is an a-hole, and I'm not dealing with them, but I'll deal with the defense. That was O.J. Simpson. There's no doubt in my mind, and he tells them the whole story. These are what we call rebuttal witnesses. I go out and I get all of these credible people who are not involved in any way in this case, and I get all their statements. You want to put this guy on? Put him on. If you don't like what he said, we got these three rebuttal witnesses who he made statements to about what he saw and what he heard. They had those rebuttal witnesses. They decided not to put him on and certainly didn't use any of those rebuttal witnesses. The defense put him on, and then we had to deal with it because they stubbornly stuck to a 10-15 barking dog timeline. Loosen up a little bit. We can show that he could easily get home in less than five minutes. We, and by the way, we videotaped this each time we did it, and we had a time clock. That was introduced. That evidence was introduced. We had a time clock that showed us going over there at 10.30 on Sunday night. All these different ways. No time was it more than 4.5 or 4.40 or something like that. If he left there, like Heidstra says, shooting out of there at 10.35 or 10.40, he'd have made it in plenty of time for Park to see him at, what, 10.52? It fits like a, like a glove, if you'll excuse the expression. Perhaps one of the more incriminating pieces of circumstantial evidence, again not introduced, was the story that Dominique Brown, Nicole's sister, told Detective Tom Lang. I went out and I interviewed her and I got very incriminating information. She could for finally and for the first time put Bruno Molly's on this guy's feet. Well, I was a little suspicious. So I, I spent some more time with her and why would you know somebody's shoes? Well, I actually made up a mug book of shoes, and she picked it out. Picked it out of the mug book. To qualify it, she said, well, I've seen that logo before. And I said, yeah, sure, okay, well, it's not that well known. She said, well, you know, they have women, Bruno Mollies. And I said, I didn't know that. I never heard of that. She said, well, yeah, Nicole had a pair of women, Bruno Mollies. I said, oh, really? And she said, yeah, in fact, I'm wearing them. And she had them on. She took them off and showed them to me. This is a very fashion-conscious young woman. Dresses immaculately. She worked at the time, I believe, for one of the stock exchanges and had to look good and, and had an eye for fashion. I don't look at people's shoes necessarily. They probably do now more than they used to. But she looks at people's shoes. And she saw shoes that she identified, the logo, the logo on the back of the shoes, as a Bruno Molly on Simpson's feet, I believe it was on the previous Easter. She gave me the circumstances describing this whole thing. Now, bear in mind, I didn't tell her that we had Bruno Molly's at the crime scene. She knew nothing. I didn't even mention the name Bruno Molly. All I did was show photographs. As a matter of fact, I asked her if she'd been familiar with these shoes in the past at all, not even mentioning if they'd been worn by O.J. Simpson. First got the Nicole statement, and then I got the Simpson statement. O.J. wore shoes like that. She was not rehearsed, not set up in any way. She made those statements voluntarily. But what perhaps best illustrates the frustration felt by Detectives Lang and Van Adder toward the prosecutors and their curious reluctance to introduce extremely incriminating evidence is the eyewitness account of a man who was at Los Angeles International Airport the night of the murders. The big question during this trial is where is the murder weapon and where is the clothing? And, uh, you know, we, we did everything we could to find this. And six months into the trial, 
this gentleman calls us. An architect, businessman, who was out at LAX shortly after 11 p.m. to pick up his wife, who was employed by American Airlines. He is seated in a small, low-profile sports car out in front of the terminal. And he says he sees this mob of people go into the terminal, and then he looks past where they went in. and sees a limo pull up to his left front. He looks at it because there's nothing else to look at. She sees a driver jump out, and the back door opens, and he sees O.J. Simpson jump out. He looks, and boy, there's O.J. Simpson, son of a gun. The red cap comes out. They take the luggage out of the car. He's looking at Simpson. In between looking at Simpson, he's looking for his wife to the right. The red cap wheels in some of the luggage, followed by the chauffeur who brings some more luggage in. The guy follows them in and looks beyond them, again looking for his wife, and he can't see her, and he looks back, and Simpson is standing to the left of the entrance uh, to the uh, terminal. There are two trash containers, four feet high, with a flat surface that opens. There's four openings, one on each side. And standing at the trash can with his arm, arm buried all the way up to the shoulder was O.J. Simpson. And he says, what I saw him was he was coming out of the trash can, like he had deposited something in the trash can. He says he pulls his arm out of the trash can, and setting up on top of the trash can is a little half-moon-shaped half travel bag, the one that, the infamous bag that's never been found that, uh, that Simpson handled himself. He wouldn't let anybody else handle that night. And he says, I see him zip up the bag and go into the terminal. Well, there, there's, where the, there's where the murder weapon and the clothing went in the trash can at LAX. The next day, he hears the media incorrectly report the murders occurred after 11 o'clock. And O.J. Simpson is a suspect in these murders. He hasn't been charged yet, but Scuttlebutt has it or whatever. This guy's a suspect. This guy says, oh, gee, I saw him at the airport. There's no way he did this. Hey, I'm an alibi witness. Guess what he does? He calls the defense and says, hey, Simpson couldn't have done this after 11 because I saw him out at the airport. He was out here. and In fact, I saw him by a trash can. And I saw him with his bag. There's no way he could have done this. What does the defense team do? They know better. They say, thank you very much. We'll get right back to you. Nine months pass. Now, uh, does the defense have to share that with us? No. Only if they put it on. Only if they use it. Nine months pass. This witness sees what's going down in the trial. He calls us. He says, hey, I think we better talk. And we brought this guy to Marsha. We brought the pictures to her. Wonderful witness that would explain to the jury what happened, most likely, to the to the evidence. To me at the time, I mean, here's the answer. People are screaming, where's the knife? Where's the shoes? Where's this? Where's that? Where's that bag? Uh, well, I think we had all of our answers. Uh, we listened to her. She interviewed this guy for 30, 40 minutes. And I'm thinking, hey, this is what we've needed. Now we have it. Now we got the, the missing link, if you will. She wouldn't use him. He says he's a, it's a it's a one-on-one -on -one witness. We don't need him. Uh, we can't use him. I, I, how, could, how could you not explain it to the jury when they've made such a big deal about where, where's the evidence? What happened to the evidence? I thought she was kidding at first. I'm not going to use him. Yeah, right. No, we're not. I mean, he could be impeached. Well, of course he could be impeached. Anything could happen. Expect him to be impeached. She wouldn't use this guy. Uh, incredible. Again, just take this guy, uh, without the, the celebrity in this case, and the games that people appear to be playing with the LAPD, you take that out of the mix, and you're going to use this guy every time. This is a dynamite witness. Unbelievable. When one hears these stories, the question that has to come to mind is this. For what conceivable reason would Marsha Clark not introduce all this incriminating evidence? I, I, that's a question I can't answer. I don't know. Again, I was not having any contact with Marsha. I wasn't having any conferences with her. I wasn't, 
I wasn't able to sit down and discuss the evidence with her. Uh, in fact, she had a sign on her door uh, for everybody, don't come in, I'm busy, or something like that. Uh, I, I don't know. She never really said, we're not going to use this because of this, that, and the other. It was just kind of you were, uh, you were led along to a point, well, well, I decided not to use it. That type of a situation. No commitment. Who got that evidence? LAPD. Why didn't you see it? It's LAPD. We can't put that on. They're on trial here. Jerry hates LAPD. The more I, I say this, the more I try to drive this home to people, I hope the more they understand that every bit of this stuff you didn't see is from the LAPD. The prosecution did not want to align itself with the LAPD. We were, in effect, on trial. They knew it. The media knew it. The jury knows it. The prosecutorial philosophy of Clark and Darden was completely foreign to me. Their philosophy seemed to be that if any piece of evidence wasn't 100% pristine, if there was any problem at all with it, no matter how small, they simply wouldn't introduce it. But that's not what normal prosecutors do. When you have powerful evidence of guilt, you offer it. You don't stumble on your way to the courtroom over the smallest threat on your path. Now, in addressing evidence that wasn't presented, let's talk about a piece of evidence which received a lot of notoriety that also wasn't introduced, but for entirely different reasons. In Mark Furman's book on the case, Murder in Brentwood, he reported that when he arrived at the Bundy murder scene at 2.10 in the morning, he and a fellow officer, Brad Roberts, saw a bloody fingerprint, presumably belonging to O.J. Simpson, on the brass deadbolt knob of the rear gate. Although he did not point the fingerprint out to lead detectives Lang and Van Adder when they arrived thereafter, he did refer to the fingerprint in his notes, which he gave to Detective Van Adder. Lang and Van Adder, however, are not sure at all that there was any fingerprint on the gate. Furman remains convinced that there was. Brad and I find this bloody fingerprint. It's, it's in blood and it's several points in quality. It's pristine. Uh, end of case. Uh, if it's not end of case, short prosecution. I mean, it's, it's very crisp the, what's going to happen. We felt very confident with that. What did happen? I'm uh, taken into Marsha Clark's office right before I testify, and I, she was preparing me for the testimony, and I said, uh, what about the uh, bloody fingerprint? And uh, she says, well, we don't have it. And I said, well, why? It was never recovered. And it goes on and on. And I said, didn't anybody read my notes? And Marsha Clark says specifically, they never read your notes, Mark. Now, she didn't say they never read your notes for two days, Mark. They, she said they never read your notes. No, that's not true. I, I, I don't even think that the statement uh, that he makes about uh, Marsha Clark telling him that the notes were never read, I don't believe that's true. Were they read right away? No. Uh, Marsha saying something like that is, is beyond me. I, I have no idea why she'd say something like that. No, we did not read Furman's notes initially. We're not supposed to. That's not part of what we do. If Furman had seen anything that he deemed relevant to that investigation, it should have been pointed out to us when we did our walkthroughs. Van Adder did a walkthrough with Phillips and Furman when he got there. Twenty minutes later, they gave me the same walkthrough. Uh, at no time did Furman point anything out of an evidentiary nature. Uh, if, in fact, he believed he saw a bloody fingerprint or anything else, he should tell somebody about it. You don't put it in notes and expect them to drop everything else that they're doing and read your notes. I read the notes. I saw, and he didn't write that there was a bloody fingerprint. He wrote that there was a possible fingerprint. And he didn't, uh, he didn't indicate where it was or anything. He put possible fingerprint. Uh, I know and was told that day that we had four print experts go over that entire scene and a bloody fingerprint never existed. They did the rear gate, and they did everything else. They were there for six or seven hours, and they didn't see anything on that rear gate. Furman, and later his partner uh, chimed in, uh, months later, or a year later, uh, says that he saw what he believes to be a print. If the rest of his notes are any indication, that's not taken seriously at all, especially by uh, after you've had uh, print people go through there and, and print the gate and they don't find it. Uh, even if it wasn't there, even if he perceived this to be a print, 
should have been preserved at that moment. He should have assigned an officer to it. He should have grabbed a photographer to take a picture of it uh, because you wouldn't ever want to take the chance of losing that. Why would you put it in your notes and pass them on without telling anybody? It makes absolutely no sense. There were blood smudges on that gate, and I believe that's probably what he saw. Let me digress here for a moment. No more than three or four prosecutors were needed on this case, yet there were 13 full-time and 12 part-time prosecutors. I mean, the Nuremberg trials never had 25 prosecutors. Apart from DNA, which required a prosecution specialist, this was not a complicated case. Instead of Marsha Clark handling nearly all the non-DNA witnesses, several different prosecutors handled witnesses before the jury. Remarkably, Marsha Clark actually went three entire months from March 31st to June 30th, 1995, without handling one single witness in front of the jury. Now, you may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, I saw her every day. You did see her every day, but not handling witnesses. And when you saw her talking to Judge Ito during this three-month period, it was outside the presence of the jury. Whenever I prosecuted a murder case, I always aspired to a masterpiece. Whether I achieved it or not is another story. But you cannot have a prosecutorial masterpiece with so many hands in the pot. By analogy, if you're painting the Mona Lisa, you don't assign different sections to different painters. Let's discuss another example of prosecutorial incompetence which resulted in what many feel was the pivotal point in the trial from which the prosecution never recovered. That's people 77. Everybody knows that you don't conduct an important experiment in court without knowing in advance what the result will be. I mean, you don't have to be a lawyer or a law student to know something like that. It's just common sense. And yet the prosecution did precisely that with respect to the glove demonstration. But there's another aspect of the glove demonstration that people have not talked about. If you do conduct the experiment, how do you conduct it? It was the position of the prosecution that even though those gloves had shrunk, even though Simpson was wearing latex gloves, they still would have fit if Simpson hadn't prevented the fit by the way he positioned his hands and fingers. Darden told the jury Simpson faked it. Clark told the jury Simpson didn't want these gloves to fit. Now those gloves were extremely important pieces of evidence. And if you're a halfway decent prosecutor, you don't turn over any evidence in any case to the defendant of all people on the face of this earth and have him tell you whether there was a fit. It's ludicrous on his face. What do you do? Well, you have a third party. Maybe the court bailiff to put the gloves on him. Feeling his hands and fingers along the way to make sure he doesn't do anything to inhibit the fit. For you lay people out there, I'll give you an example. It's not a perfect parallel, but I think you'll get the point. Let's say the police find a gun on a suspect or in his home and they believe it's the murder weapon. Well, what they do, they test fire the weapon into cotton or water, and then they take the test fire bullets, they put them under a comparison microscope with the evidence bullets to see if the markings called striations match up. They don't turn the gun over to the defendant and have him conduct the test and report back to them. What happened here, it's going to sound a little sarcastic, but it's, it's the essence of what happened. I mean, Darden came up to Simpson in court, gave him the gloves and says, here, OJ, try on these gloves. If they fit, you're in trouble. If they don't fit, you might be able to walk out of here and play golf. Now, knowing in advance, OJ, if these gloves don't fit, you might be able to walk out of here. Tell us, OJ, do these gloves fit? That's not incompetence. That's beyond incompetence. It's absolutely unbelievable that they would turn the gloves over to Simpson and have him be in complete charge and have him be the one to determine if there was a fit. One of the strengths of the defense team was that they never let the facts stand in the way of making an argument whose logic was as full of holes as a piece of Swiss cheese. And the prosecution almost always let them get away with it. Nowhere was this more evident than in the area of DNA and the issue of contamination. From Cochran's opening statement at the beginning of the trial to his and Sheck's final summation, the defense said the prosecution's blood evidence was, quote, contaminated, and hence their constant garbage in, garbage out argument. In other words, once the blood was contaminated by dirt, bacteria, the elements, a theory that the defense postulated throughout the trial but never once proved to be true, it was garbage. And therefore, this garbage submitted for analysis could only yield a garbage result. Now, common sense should immediately tell you that the only thing that was garbage here was the defense theory. Even if the blood at the scene was contaminated or degraded by the elements, why would the lab test on the blood produce the result that it was Simpson's blood if it wasn't? Is there anything about these environmental effects, whether sunlight, humidity, rain, etc., that can actually change DNA from one type to another? No. 
you wouldn't get false results, you'd just get no results. What, what do you mean you wouldn't get false results? Well, except for a very unique or specific situation, degradation of a sample doesn't change the type to another type, it just makes it so you don't get any information at all. So when you say no information, when you do your test, what do you come up with? No result. No, there's, there's no typeable result that's obtained. If we had contaminated any of the evidence at that crime scene, um, degradation would not have made that blood turn into O.J. Simpson's blood. It's just not possible. In other words, contrary to what the defense argued throughout the entire trial, contamination could only decrease, not increase, the likelihood of a DNA match. Because the prosecutors didn't know how to handle this issue at all, the defense got away with it. And what made it easier for the defense to get away with it was the fact that it took the prosecution so long to even address itself to the issue. It was only after the long, highly misleading cross-examination of the LAPD criminalists that the prosecution called Dr. Robin Cotton to the stand to explain to the jury that none of the alleged contamination and mishandling of the evidence they had been hearing about for days on end was relevant, since neither contamination nor degradation could produce a false DNA positive of Simpson's blood. But by that time, the incorrect contamination theory had been burned into the jurors' minds, where it apparently remained. For instance, two of the jurors, Lionel Cryer and David Aldana, when asked by the media after the trial about the DNA evidence, blurted out like automatons, garbage in, garbage out. One juror wrote in her book, quote, there was a lot of discussion about how sloppily the evidence had been handled, how it could have gotten contaminated. Since we know that first impressions are so important, and since the prosecutors had already been placed on notice as far back as Cochran's opening statement that the defense was going to try to float the specious contamination argument, wouldn't common sense seem to dictate that you call Dr. Cotton to the stand for a primer on DNA before, not after, the defense's cross-examination of the LAPD criminalists? Dr. Cotton's belated appearance on the witness stand, an obvious result of the prosecution's incompetence, was decidedly bad timing. A surprising and particularly harmful error the prosecution made in this case is that they frequently violated a basic fundamental prosecutorial technique, namely, that when you know the defense is going to present evidence damaging or unfavorable to your side, you preempt the defense by presenting that evidence yourself. Now, why do this? Well, introducing negative evidence yourself achieves two objectives. Number one, it conveys to the jury your willingness to see that all evidence unfavorable to your case as well as favorable comes out, that you're not trying to suppress it in open court or outside their presence, and this helps to establish your credibility with the jury. Secondly, it frequently converts a left hook by your opponent into a left jab. If it doesn't do that, it will almost always shave at least a few decibels off the opposition's trumpets. Because it indicates to the jury that the evidence can't really be all that bad if it was matter-of-factly and almost cavalierly brought out by you on direct examination of your own witness. What I try to do on direct examination, basically, is conduct my opponent's cross-examination for him, but bringing out the information the way I want it to be brought out. Then, when my opponent stands up to conduct his cross-examination, he has very little to ask. For the most part, almost to his embarrassment, he's going over old ground. Now, this is just common sense, right? Yet the prosecutors in this case, for the most part, did not do this. In fact, the level of prosecutorial sophistication demonstrated by Clark and Darden in this case was so low that I can't even be sure that they knew they were supposed to introduce evidence negative to the prosecution themselves. Let me give you a few examples of what we've just been talking about. And when he greeted you and your sister Dominique and your parents, what, what was his demeanor? Um, he had a very bizarre look in his eyes. It was a very far away look. It was... Um, it was actually really kind of spooky. It was a frightening look. Nicole's sister, Denise Brown, and Candace Garvey, a friend, testified that at the dance recital just hours before the murders, Simpson was acting strange. He wasn't friendly at all, ignored their glance, and it was said he seemed to be simmering and had a faraway spooky look on his face. It's obvious that the inference the prosecution wanted the jury to draw was that Simpson was in a dark, ugly mood the type of mood that culminated in his committing the murders later that evening. 
on cross-examination, the defense presented a video which they had gotten from the prosecution showing Simpson right after the recital in a very good mood, at one time almost doubling over with laughter. That was just terrible for the prosecution. It was very embarrassing and had to hurt their credibility in the jury's eyes. It's unbelievable that the prosecution never presented that video themselves on direct examination. Denise Brown and Candace Garvey could have testified that, yes, that's the way he looked afterward, but that's not the way he was looking and acting before and during the recital. The effect of their damaging testimony against Simpson would probably have been diminished only slightly. As it was, however, their testimony was almost totally negated by the video. Here, as with Simpson's statement to the detectives, it looked as if the prosecution was trying to suppress evidence favorable to the defense. Although Cochran failed to make this argument in his summation, he easily could have walked over to the prosecution table during his address and told the jury, these prosecutors here are representing the people of the state of California. They are public prosecutors who are supposed to be dedicated to fairness, justice, bringing out the truth. But if you had to rely on them, you never would have seen that video. They weren't about to show it to you. We had to show it to you. What could be worse than to have the jury believe the prosecution is suppressing evidence favorable to the defense and deliberately trying to deceive the jury? I mean, if Clark and Darden didn't know they were supposed to present evidence like this themselves, wasn't there anyone in their humongous supporting staff to advise them of it? Co-prosecutor Brian Kelberg, head of the DA's medical legal unit, had Dr. Lack on the stand for an incredible eight days of direct examination. Now, if that's not a record, it's pretty darn close. Kelberg went into extraordinary detail and depth on every single point imaginable, including a reenactment of the murders themselves, with Dr. Lack playing the villain's role. But the coroner only had to be called to testify to key things, like the cause of death, the number of stab wounds and which ones were the fatal ones, the approximate time of death, a description of the murder weapon or weapons, and whether any of the mistakes made by Dr. Golden were the type which could have affected the ultimate conclusions. That's all. Examining Dr. Lack for eight straight days created problems injurious to the prosecution. Such an extremely detailed and lengthy direct examination could only convey to the jury that the prosecution felt there were many critical issues surrounding the autopsies which actually there were not, and furthermore, that the prosecution was very worried about these issues. If they weren't, why were they spending so much time on them? But the examining prosecutor, Brian Kelberg, was not satisfied with merely extensive details. He wanted Dr. Lack to also tell the jury exactly how these murders happened, right down to the order and sequence of the stab wounds. If I, being as pro-prosecution as I am, found myself saying, how in the heck does a doctor know this? You can imagine what the jury was thinking. Although coroners do form opinions, there comes a point when for any coroner, even Quincy, extensive over-analysis can only become pure speculation and conjecture. But in the eight-day direct examination of the coroner, which was seven and a half days too long, out of the hundreds upon hundreds of questions the prosecutor asked to preempt a defense, neither he nor his colleagues apparently had it within themselves to ask the most important preemptive question of all. Doctor, I take it you cannot testify to a reasonable medical certainty whether there was one or more than one killer. This question should have been an automatic one for Kelberg, particularly since he was so determined to preempt the defense. But it wasn't. On cross-examination, guess what one of Shapiro's first questions was? And with all of your training, experience, education, reading all these books, you cannot tell us with a reasonable degree of medical certainty how many people were responsible for the deaths of these two people. I, uh, I said that one person could have done it with one single edge knife uh, in my testimony. Can you tell us with a reasonable degree of medical certainty how many people are responsible for these homicides? No. Of course, when Shapiro got this concession, it had to have sounded very important to the jury. Whereas, if it had been brought out matter-of-factly on direct examination, its impact would have been substantially diminished. Do you know what the headline was here in Los Angeles the following day after Kelberg had spent eight days trying to preempt the defense? Defense elicits key concession from coroner. 
Another area of incompetence on the part of the prosecution in this case was the astonishingly weak posture the prosecution took towards Simpson right before the jury's eyes. Instead of standing up to him and denouncing him for what he was, a cold-blooded killer, they did the precise opposite, actually speaking of him in very flattering terms. And the question is, if they didn't have the guts to stand up in front of the jury and treat Simpson for what he was, a double murderer, how could they expect the jury to come back into that courtroom, look Simpson in the eyes, and say by their verdict that he was guilty of murder? What a prosecutor wants to convey to a jury from the very beginning of the case to the end is that based on the evidence, they have no choice but to convict, that the evidence is so overwhelming that the people of the state of California, the people outside that courtroom, not only want but expect a verdict of guilty, that it is the jury's sacred duty to return a verdict of guilty. Telling the jury, you may not like me for bringing this case, I'm not winning any popularity contest for doing so, is definitely not the way to go. This is where you want to be more than any place on earth. And you point at this man and say, he's a double murderer, and I'm going to prove it, and I want to be here. I would be no place else. Uh, instead, she sets, sets the stage to be in the same awe as the media is for Simpson. Why doesn't she want to be there? She didn't even know who Simpson was before this case. The first meeting I had with Marsha Clark. My sister and I, Dominique and I, we walked up into her office and um, we knocked on her door and we walk in and the first pictures that I saw were of Nicole's slashed throat because she didn't turn them around or she didn't get rid of them. Or of all those horrific pictures of Nicole laying there dead and um, and all of a sudden she sees what we're staring at and it was a close-up of Nicole here with all everything just wide open and um she says to me she says oh god she goes it's become like furniture I don't even know it's there and that's how sympathetic this woman was and those are pictures that nobody should have ever had to see let alone her sisters, let alone her own family. And, uh, I mean, they weren't even shown to the public, for God's sakes, and we walk in and they're right there. And that's how she conducts business. Marsha Clark has no heart at all. The only thing she cared about was her $4.2 million for her book, her speaking engagements, and, uh, and just being in the public. And that's it. When all this nonsense started, I told Lang, I said, you know, Tom, I think you were right. I picked the wrong prosecutor in this case. But, but you know, we had talked about that during the entire case. Tom was not happy with me getting her involved in this. And as this case progressed, I became less happy with my decision to get her involved. And uh, I think sometime during the trial, and I don't know exactly what point it was, I think I actually admitted to Tom that, you know, hey, you were right on this. We got the wrong person. What the jury wants from the prosecutor is that he or she be eminently fair. Not sensitive, but fair. No more than two minutes after Clark gave her opening statement at the beginning of the trial, a New York Times reporter called me for an evaluation of Clark's performance. And the very first thing she asked was, was she sensitive enough? Sensitive enough, I said. That was her problem. She was too sensitive. She was not nearly forceful or dynamic enough. And the same was true of the prosecutor's final summations, both surprisingly weak. Not only weren't they forceful and decisive, they actually went to the other extreme, making statements which psychologically, with any jury, were very damaging to the prosecution. And I told you when this began that I had the hardest job. Nobody wants to do anything to this man. We don't. There's nothing personal about this. But the law is the law. Isn't Darden almost in effect saying, you know, we'd love to give this man two free murders, but we can't. The law won't allow it. And when he says nobody wants to do anything to this man, isn't he telling the jury that everyone outside the courtroom is pulling for Simpson? This is nothing short of unbelievable. I didn't think Darden could top this. But unfortunately, he did. In his closing argument, he actually said this to the jury. Whatever you do, the decision is yours. And I'm glad that it's not mine. Now, what the heck does that mean? Hasn't Darden just told the jury that this is a tough, close case? Isn't it almost like telling them it's a reasonable doubt case? The prosecutor, of course, should always convey to the jury just the exact opposite. 
that the evidence of guilt is so clear, so obvious, and so overwhelming that they shouldn't have any trouble, any trouble at all, coming back with a guilty verdict. In addition to being weak in their demeanor and far too casual in the delivery of their words to the jury, the two prosecutors didn't fight at all for fairness in the courtroom. Summation is the time during the trial when the court gives the lawyers far more latitude than in any other part of the trial. The opposing lawyers, through time-honored tradition in the legal profession, rarely object, interrupting only when the opposition clearly trespasses far beyond the already broad perimeters of permissible oratory. During the opening arguments of Clark and Darden, the defense only objected three times and were apologetic for doing so. Once the defense completed its final summation, however, and knew the prosecution could not reply in kind, the defense tactics changed dramatically for the prosecution's rebuttal argument, their final chance to address the jury. And they did. Objected upon that. Overruled. Overruled, counsel. This is argument. Objected upon Overruled. Counsel, it speaks for itself. Okay. Staying three, perhaps he got. Overruled. So reasonable inference from the evidence. Okay. Throw right past you. Overruled. Overruled. Overruled, counsel. Overruled. Overruled, counsel. Be seated. Overruled. 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 Proceed. Cochran and Sheck interrupted Darden 21 times. That's ridiculous, you say? Well, in Marsha Clark's final address to the jury, the last address either prosecutor could make in the case, and the most important address to the jury for the prosecution, she was interrupted by Cochran and Sheck an incredible 50 times. 71 times, then, the defense objected. This is unprecedented in my experience. No one whom I've spoken to has ever heard or read about such an egregious display of gross and improper courtroom behavior during an opponent's final summation as that put on by Johnny Cochran and Barry Sheck. Listen to the hypocritical Sheck's reaction when Marsha Clark interrupted him for one of the very few times during his summation. And we think that the integrity of this system... I'm sorry. What is this? At the sidebar, after disagreeing with Marsha Clark over what he had said to the jury, Barry Sheck said, I resent this interruption. And Judge Ito, knowing Cochran and Sheck were deliberately making frivolous objections simply to destroy the effectiveness of the prosecutor's summations, did not once hold either of them in contempt of court or even once admonish them to stop their outrageous, unprofessional, and yes, dishonorable conduct. How do I know Judge Ito knew the objections were frivolous? I know because out of the 71 objections, he sustained two. And this is the same Judge Ito who held Darden in contempt of court. Darden had spoken over the judge's voice just once in response to a serious insult by Cochran when they were at sidebar, outside the presence of the jury. And Darden's remark caused absolutely no harm to anyone, much less the opposing side. What should the prosecutors have done to stop this? Could they have done anything? Yes. After the third or fourth frivolous objection by either Cochran or Sheck, Marsha Clark should have asked to approach the bench. Once there, she could have addressed the judge by saying something to him along these lines. Judge Ito, you know, everyone in this courtroom knows that all of these objections, particularly those by Mr. Sheck, are completely frivolous and designed solely to destroy the effectiveness of my final address to the jury. In all deference to you, Judge Ito, I'm not asking you, I'm demanding that the next time Mr. Sheck interrupts me with a silly objection, you hold him in contempt of court. And if he continues after that, I want Sheck in the lockup. If either Mr. Cochran or Mr. Sheck continues to object and you let him get by with it, again, in all deference to you, my remarks to you, as well as to them, will not be made here at the bench, but in open court before the jury and the millions of people who are watching. I can assure these defense attorneys they're not going to get by with this. But as we know, nothing like this was said. Let me tell you something. The prosecutors were far too civilized in this case for the defense attorneys. I can assure you that would not have happened if I'd been in that courtroom. Since we know the jury bought into the frame-up theory and the contamination of blood theory, Simpson's own very incriminating words to the police would have stood head and shoulders above all the other evidence of guilt. 
Being handicapped was bad enough, even if Clark had made the most of what she had. But in her summation, Clark proceeded to make the most garbled, god-awful argument imaginable on this point. During her opening argument, Clark said to the jury, quote, So now we have the defendant getting his hand cut on the night of his wife's stabbing, cut on his left hand, which just happens to be the hand that the murderer cut that same night. That's an alarming coincidence, unquote. I read you Marsha Clark's words because unfortunately no video exists. Judge Ito, in one of his fits of pique, temporarily terminated coverage that day since the camera caught Simpson taking notes in too close a shot for Ito's liking. But the transcript makes it clear that in presenting the very damaging evidence of Simpson's cut finger to the jury, Marsha Clark screwed it up badly. From the literal context of her words, Clark seemed to be arguing to the jury that the coincidence was not that Simpson innocently cut himself around the very same time of the murders, but that he cut himself on, quote, his left hand, which just happens to be the hand that the murderer cut that same night, unquote. Remarkably, she succeeded in reducing a coincidence in the millions down to one out of two hands. Then, on a roll, she became even more off base in her argument, referring to Dr. Huzenga, the defense doctor who examined Simpson two days after the murders and in addition to the deep cut to the knuckle of Simpson's left middle finger, saw three other small cuts and four abrasions to Simpson's hands, but didn't ask him how or even when he got the cuts. Clark made this incredible statement to the jury. You know, I can see getting one cut, maybe two on your hand, but four cuts and seven abrasions, and we're supposed to believe that that's unrelated to a murder in which the killer's left hand was cut and bleeding as he left the crime scene? In view of this remarkable statement, maybe Clark really didn't believe that innocently cutting yourself around the very same time your former wife was murdered is much of a coincidence at all. It was only the number of cuts that was suspicious to her. Unbelievable. Continuing on her bad role, she asked the jury this question. When we cut ourselves and we drip blood, what do we do? We clean it up. So according to Clark, the first thing that one normally does when bleeding is to clean up the floor, not stop the bleeding. But doesn't everyone know that stopping the bleeding is a much more automatic response than cleaning it up? In fact, even though we know Simpson is guilty, since he had to catch a plane to Chicago, the fact that he postponed cleaning up is not incriminating at all. But whether you're going to Chicago or not, if you're dripping blood all over your car and home, you instinctively try to stop the flow of blood. Unless, of course, you're in a state of mind Mr. Simpson was in frantic after having just murdered two people. I have to believe that if Clark had bothered to look over just once her prepared remarks on this all-important issue of Simpson's bleeding on the night of the murders, this intelligent and experienced criminal prosecutor would have vastly improved her argument and articulation on this issue. If she in fact did look over her prepared remarks and still did not see how weak her argument was and how poor and garbled were the logic and language she used, then Garcetti had no business assigning a prosecutor of this ability to this case. But if she didn't look over the remarks she prepared for her opening argument, then I say to her that she owed it to her client, the people of the state of California, to have done a hell of a lot more preparation than she did before she stood up and argued on their behalf. As we discussed earlier, William Bodziak proved that two of Lee's potential second killer shoe prints were nothing more than the footprint and tool marks left by workmen years earlier. Permanent indentations in the concrete. This was an incredible error by Dr. Lee. But Clark's entire statement on the destroyed credibility of Lee, as we saw earlier, was simply this. Now, Dr. Lee tried to tell us about a second set of shoe prints, as you recall. But I think Mr. Bodziak made it very clear what that was all about. As I said, this was just an incredibly weak and ineffective statement. Another example of the unbelievable, never-ending incompetence of the prosecution. I mean, if you're not going to recall, summarize, and emphasize Bodziak's testimony on these points for the jury, and then draw powerful inferences from it, why bother to give a final argument at all? A courtroom spectator would have done a better job. Here, the prosecution had a wonderful opportunity to show the jury that a star defense witness, the supposed top forensic sleuth in the country, a witness whose opinions the defense team treated like holy writ, repeating them over and over again, 
that this witness had been shown to have made a terrible mistake the incompetence of which far surpassed anything done by Dennis Fung, Andrea Mazzola, Colin Yamauchi, Phil Van Adder, or any other prosecution witness whose performance and opinions Cochran and Scheck had ridiculed ad nauseum. Where is it, Mr. Fung? Barry Scheck's adolescent sing-song taunts to Dennis Fung were in regard to a relatively insignificant point. But here, with conclusive proof of Henry Lee's mistake, Marsha Clark could have taken the opportunity to stand up there in front of that jury with photos of those permanent indentations from years ago and say, how do you explain that, Dr. Lee? Instead, Marsha Clark merely says, I think Mr. Bodziak made it very clear. Not to this jury, Marsha. Not to this jury. Not to a jury that couldn't spell DNA if you spotted them the D in the N. They had to be spoon-fed. The prosecution's incompetence was in large part responsible for this jury walking out of this trial and telling reporters we were all very impressed by Dr. Lee. Let me show you a few examples of Marsha Clark's inexcusable lack of preparation for her opening and closing arguments. As you listen, think also of the reality that she's representing the people of the state of California, prosecuting someone charged with two gruesome murders. The two victims are decomposing in their graves. There are 50 million people watching on TV, and she's had nine and a half months to prepare for her final words to the jury. The total command of his case that a prosecutor should exhibit to the jury does not allow for thinks, forgots, and can't remembers. And there was a photograph shown to you during one of the football games that I'm trying to remember the date of. I think it was 92. But they still didn't run out there, okay? That was... I can't remember, I think he said it was around the time, he couldn't be specific about the time, that's right. But he said he knew that Van Adder was there, that robbery homicide had taken over the case. Now Van Adder didn't get there I think till four or so. The record will refresh your memory, I'm, I can't remember exactly. There was testimony and then there was argument about this sheet and you're going to have it, it's in evidence, isn't it, Your Honor? The blood search sheet, worksheet? Yes, it is, good. Now, the truth of the matter was that the testimony from Mr. McDonnell and from Dr. Lee, I believe, but certainly Mr. McDonnell was, at the end of the trial, or at the end of the people's case, we had a, or maybe it was the whole trial, we had it because Mark Storfer said he looked out his window at 10.23. I, I read it, and I reviewed it, and now I'm so tired I can't remember it exactly. I forget where I left off, so I'm just going to pick up with something else. Do you sense a pattern here? It's called lack of preparation. And I can't even begin to tell you how bad this is. The examples you just heard were merely representative. There were many more. This is all proof that Clark never went over her summation even once. If she had, how was it possible she could have said even one, much less all, of these things to the jury? Unless we want to believe something equally bad, that she was aware she didn't have certain information nailed down and made no effort to get it herself or have one of the other 24 prosecutors helping her on the case get it for her. It was obvious that the defense lawyers, Cochran and especially Sheck, fighting for injustice, had put more effort and preparation into their summations than the two prosecutors had. For those viewers who think I'm directing all the prosecution blame at Marsha Clark, don't. There's plenty to be shared by Christopher Darden. She lived right next door at 873 South Bundy. I believe her time was 1020, was it? Was it 1020? It was 1020. Don't you think that that little deal in Chicago with the glass and Marsha Clark could be talking more about that? You want to talk more about that? And Cato Kalin told you from the witness stand that they had, a, that, that they had some, some kind of commitment either to each other or she to him. I'm not sure of all the details, but you heard the testimony. And if my memory fails me, then, you know, rely on, on the testimony in case I'm incorrect. What, Chris? In preparing your summation, you didn't look at the transcript yourself? The one you get at the end of each court day? You're just winging it in front of the jury? This is inexcusable for a prosecutor. As I already indicated, I prepare my summation in a big case before the first witness in the trial has been called. People have asked me, how is this possible? And I tell them it's the simplest thing in the world. As soon as I learn the strengths and weaknesses of my case, I immediately start working on how I'm going to argue my strengths and what I'm going to say in response to defense attacks on the weaknesses. Every night of the trial, you go over your summation. 
you polish, you fine tune, you add, you delete, you modify certain things you hadn't anticipated. The night before you give it, you go over it for the tenth time and you try to get a good night's sleep. And here's Marsha Clark and Chris Darden, like college students cramming for an exam, staying up till 4.30 in the morning on the day of their final summation, not going over it, but preparing it, and then a few hours later saying things like this to the jury. I think this and I think that. Although both Clark and Darden gave embarrassingly bad rebuttal arguments, the talking heads and legal experts were very impressed. For instance, one of the former DAs who was a network commentator opined that Clark had given a, quote, brilliant rebuttal. It was, to him. And a law school professor gave Clark's rebuttal an A-plus for presentation, B-plus for strategy, and B-plus for impact. The professor gave Darden an A for presentation, A-minus for strategy, and A-minus for impact. In other words, apparently both Clark and Darden were about as good as you can get. The reality is that the two prosecutors could hardly have been any worse. I kept waiting for the prosecutors in their rebuttal to point out that the only thing they had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt was Mr. Simpson's guilt. But they never did. Not once. And the Simpson jurors swallowed Sheck's argument hook, line, and sinker. Discussing the fact that Simpson's blood was at the murder scene Listen to what jury foreperson Amanda Cooley writes in her book. We can't explain it away. Me personally, I have not tried to explain it away at all. This was not one of the issues, and that was definitely not the reasonable doubt we based our decision on. Simpson's blood at the murder scene was not one of the issues? Can you imagine that? Amanda and her friends had more important things to concern themselves with than Simpson's blood being at the murder scene. The game, apparently, was not about whether or not Simpson's guilt had been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, but whether a reasonable doubt could be found anywhere at all in the case. And if it could, it was a reasonable doubt case, and Simpson was entitled to a not guilty verdict. For instance, Cooley said that if Furman was a liar, quote, you've got reasonable doubt right there. The bottom line, of course, is that even if the LAPD laboratory was a cesspool of contamination, in fact, even if a piece of evidence was planted or tampered with, or even if Furman was a liar, this did not preclude the jury as a matter of law from concluding that the prosecution, by the weight of all the other evidence, had proved Simpson's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Yet Sheck led the jury to believe that if there was a reasonable doubt as to any contested fact in the entire case, Simpson was entitled to a not guilty verdict. But in their rebuttal arguments, not one word, not one, was uttered by either prosecutor to clarify this point, which could not possibly have been more important. Although we know there is no doubt of Simpson's guilt, the prosecutors, by the language they used in arguing reasonable doubt, suggested to the jury that perhaps there was some small doubt of Simpson's guilt. Not once did they ever tell the jury that they had proved Simpson's guilt beyond all doubt which they of course had, and which I'm sure they strongly believed. When Simpson's blood was found at the murder scene, that fact alone proved his guilt beyond all doubt. Yet the prosecutors insisted on implying to the jury that although there was no reasonable doubt of Simpson's guilt, there was some small doubt. For instance, although Marcia Clark, in her very final words to the jury, said, quote, we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt, far beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant committed these murders, didn't her obvious failure and refusal to say the prosecution had proved Simpson's guilt beyond all doubt imply that maybe they hadn't? Interestingly enough, as you may know, Marcia Clark titled her book, Without a Doubt. She was referring, of course, to her belief that there was no doubt of Simpson's guilt. But Marcia, since you believed this, wouldn't it have been nice if you had said those words to the jury instead of saving it for the title of your book? Again, at no time during the trial, did either prosecutor tell the jury that the prosecution had proved Simpson's guilt beyond all doubt? In fact, Darden flat out told the jury there was some small doubt of Simpson's guilt. Mr. Cochran said to you, well, reasonable doubt is doubt with a reason. That's not reasonable doubt. When you look back at that instruction, when you look back at the reasonable doubt instruction, you'll see when it comes to human affairs, there's always some degree of doubt, no matter how small. Not in this case, Chris, not in this case. 
and you don't tell a jury, any jury, that there's some small doubt of the defendant's guilt. Not if you're trying to convict them, Chris. While it is always wise and proper to point out to the jury more than once, as Darden did, that the prosecution under the law does not have to prove the defendant's guilt beyond all possible doubt, only beyond a reasonable doubt, wouldn't it have been wise to then go on and tell the jury, particularly when you had, in fact, proved Simpson's guilt beyond all doubt, that here, even though we didn't have the burden, we did, in fact, prove Simpson's guilt beyond all possible doubt. Let's now address what undoubtedly has to be considered one of the most unbelievable aspects of the prosecution's performance. It literally defies comprehension. Simpson never talked about framing. That was, that was a, uh, a deal that came from the uh, defense attorneys. Uh, in fact, Simpson told, uh, told uh, Lang on the telephone that uh, he knew he was a good guy and he knew he was just doing his job. And, uh, uh, you know, a typical response from someone that felt that they were being framed would be, hey, you know, what the hell are you people doing? Why aren't you looking for the real killer? Why are you trying to say I did it? He never said that. He never asked the questions that should have been asked. He never made the statements that should have been made. When people talk or accuse me of planting the bloody glove, on one side, I laugh uncontrollably because no, nobody can be this stupid to think this. When Simpson's murdering these two people, I'm on the freeway coming back from Palm Desert from a protective league convention. I go home. I go to bed with my wife a little after 11. I'm called at 105. I go there not knowing what happened or to whom. I never even know that it's Nicole Brown Simpson that's deceased. I am told to go to Rockingham. I'm making plans to go to breakfast with my boss and my partner. We have work to do on other cases. Once we're relieved, we're going back. I'm told to go to Rockingham. I talk to Cato. Cato directs me to the noise. Where I go to see the noise, I find the glove. Does anybody see any place where I'm controlling one movement I've made from 105 in the morning until the time I find the glove? And then when I find the glove, the defense, what they conclude is that I transported the glove. Did anybody see the defense subpoena my clothes that I wore that night? my socks, my shoes, my pants, my jacket, my shirt. I set them aside in a plastic bag the minute this accusation came out. And I kept them there the entire trial. All they had to do was ask, dump them off. Why didn't they ask? Because they knew the answer already. They knew nobody transported any glove up there. They knew their client did it. It was, it was obvious. You're either stupid or you know it. The main core of the defense case was that their client, Simpson, had been framed by the LAPD. This was so much the heart of their case that by the time of final summation, they were de-emphasizing somewhat the second prong of their defense, that contamination caused by the elements, as well as the LAPD's incompetence in the gathering and preservation of evidence, had rendered all these subsequent scientific test results, mostly DNA, unreliable. At least 90% of Cochrane's summation and 60% of Sheck's summation dealt, in one way or another, with the suggestion of a conspiracy by the police to frame Simpson for the two murders. Everywhere they looked, they smelled a rat. But who were the real rats in the courtroom? How could the socks be there at 435 when you just saw they're not there at 413? Who's fooling whom here? They're setting this man up, and you can see it with your own eyes. Not in this democracy can we allow dishonest, manufactured evidence to lie at the heart of a case like this. Why would it be more than sticky that he brought it over there and planted it there to try to make this case? Somebody played with this evidence. It took all four detectives, all four LAPD experienced detectives to leave the bodies. They had notified the coroners. They didn't have a criminalist to go over to notify O.J. Simpson. They're lying. Let's try to get over that wall give Furman a chance to start what he's doing. That any mountain has long ago been reduced to a little more than a molehill under an avalanche of lies and conspiracy. It was sad. The depths to which they had sunk to try as part of this cover-up 
And these were just a few of the many allegations of an LAPD conspiracy to frame Simpson. The thrust of nearly all that was said by Cochran and Check in their closing argument related in one way or another to this allegation. I wasn't angered by uh, having to answer whether I was in a cover-up. I thought it was a ridiculous uh, accusation and I thought that people would just see through it. It was so ridiculous. I mean, we, how, how could we get together and make uh, this giant conspiracy when we don't even have that much contact with each other. I mean, uh, I'd never even met Mark Furman before uh, that day of the crime scene. I've worked with uh, Lang and Van Adder maybe three or four times before. Uh, there were just too many people to have to go through to make a conspiracy like that work. I think the whole concept scared me a lot. I'm being accused of being part of some giant conspiracy and uh, there's a certain part of you that's mad and a certain part of you, boy how do I defend myself against something like that this is and you know why should I defend myself I didn't do anything wrong it was under the media attention it, it was a pretty frightening thought to, to hear somebody actually make that kind of an accusation and uh, for the media and so many other people to give it any credence at all. For the most part, I, I think anybody with common sense could see that it's asinine though. It, it's almost humorous that any of us would be accused of being involved in this. It's that ridiculous. Since it had been obvious to everyone for months that a police conspiracy to frame Simpson was the essence of the defense, how did Marsha Clark, in her opening argument, attack the bogus allegations put forth by the duplicitous duel of Cochran and Scheck? If there is evidence of a conspiracy, it would be my obligation to dismiss. Pure and simple. And I can go on to the next case. But there isn't. Unbelievably, this is all Marsha Clark said in her opening argument. She never uttered one single word to knock down the frame-up conspiracy allegation. She treated it like a non-issue. In reality, after commencing her opening argument on an affirmative note by arguing that in looking at the case as a whole, it was clear that the evidence pointed overwhelmingly to Simpson's guilt, she should have dealt with the conspiracy issue in depth in her opening argument. She should have done this before she got into the heart of her summation, setting forth all the evidence and the inferences from that evidence that established Simpson's guilt. The reason, I think, is obvious. If a lawyer doesn't first try to eliminate the negative, then at the very moment he is making his positive arguments, the jury is thinking, well, what you say may be true, but what about this and what about that? And this necessarily dilutes the force and persuasiveness of his argument. By the time the lawyer argues the strong points of his case, he should want the jurors' minds to be completely clear and receptive to the arguments they are hearing. But Marsha Clark never said one word throughout her entire opening argument to knock down the alleged police conspiracy to frame Simpson, which was the heart of the defense's case. And it wasn't as if Clark didn't realize the extreme importance of the police conspiracy argument. They got to make you believe that blood was planted. It's the cornerstone of their defense. It really is, because as I've pointed out, if you know that's his blood left on the rear gate, if you know that's her blood on his socks, what are you left to conclude? In her rebuttal, her last address to the jury, she treated the issue so superficially that she commented on it for less than one minute, and even then she waited until the end of her argument to do so. After over one year to think about and prepare a strong response to the heart of the defense case, these are the only words she uttered to the jury to attempt to rebut the allegation that the police conspired to frame O.J. Simpson. Housewives calling in on radio talk shows during the trial said more than this. Do you realize how many people would have had to have gotten involved in a conspiracy within an hour? Can you imagine how this could happen? Detective Van Adder and Detective Lang never even knew Mark Furman until they met him that night at Bundy. And yet the allegation by the defense is that they got together that night meeting first time for the very first time and everybody's covering up and conspiring all of a sudden. Impossible. Not only that, but there are other people involved as well, people we don't even know who they are, according to the defense, who are willing to get involved in this. 
You realize how many people have to be involved? I mean, it boggles the mind. We don't even know who they're talking about. But that's the contortion you have to go through to believe in this conspiracy theory. Just one paragraph, Marcia, just one paragraph to respond to the central thrust of the defense's entire case, only 45 seconds in your opening and closing arguments to convince the jury there was no possible police conspiracy in this case? How can this be? Clark knew the importance of the conspiracy allegation and therefore the danger of not addressing it. She acknowledged her obvious awareness of this reality throughout the entire trial. Listen to what she said to Judge Ito on the morning of August 1st, 1995. This was simply one chance to put them in during the defense case. There may be others, but if there are not, on rebuttal to refute the conspiracy theme and to refute the planting theme that the defense has throughout carried in this case. Elsewhere in her argument, and I discuss this later, Clark did deal very briefly and ineffectively, not with the conspiracy argument of several LAPD officers conspiring to frame Simpson, but whether Furman, by himself, planted the lone item, the lone item of the glove. But in an opening argument and rebuttal by her that consumed close to 400 pages of transcript, Clark spent less than one page, less than one four hundredth of her argument, responding to and trying to knock down the main argument of the defense in the Simpson case. If Clark was bad, Christopher Darden was even worse. Of his 170 pages of final summation, he devoted one-sixth of a page, about one one-thousandth of his argument, to rebutting the main argument of the defense. Now, I know this sounds impossible. The only problem is that it happens to be true. They want to tell you that the police conspired, conspired against O.J. Simpson. Nicole says they'd been out there eight times before and never did anything to him. I don't know. That is Willie Ford's testimony. You heard that brother testify. He looked like a co-conspirator to you. So neither Clark nor Darden, in their four collective final summations to the jury, even began to come up with any kind of a response to the heart, the centerpiece, the core of the defense case. They treated the issue that was most responsible for the not guilty verdict in this case almost as if it didn't even exist. The defense in this case, as everyone knows, was screaming conspiracy, police frame-up, planning of evidence before the trial even started. In his opening statement, Cochran made all of these same identical allegations. And during the trial, virtually every witness the prosecution called to the witness stand, the defense attorneys in their cross-examination, constantly suggested something nefarious conspiratorial was going on. Now, if you're a halfway decent prosecutor, don't you sit down for however long it takes, I don't care if it takes 100 hours, to come up with 9, 10, 11, 12 powerful arguments to knock down the heart of the defense case. Because if you don't do that, no matter how much evidence you have against the defendant, if the jury thinks he was framed, he walks out of court, which is precisely what happened in this case. Yet in the eight hours of final summation that these two prosecutors gave, instead of devoting a minimum of two hours to knocking down the conspiracy theory, the heart of the defense case, unbelievably, they only argued for about one minute out of the eight hours addressing themselves to the conspiracy theory. One minute to knock down nine and a half months of conspiracy allegations. There are 600 pages of final summation transcript by the two prosecutors in this case, but you're not going to find more than one page addressing itself to the conspiracy theory. Yet no one, none of the talking heads, no book, no magazine article, made this observation. Why? I think it was Thoreau who spoke about the eternal struggle to see what is right in front of our eyes. People see what they expect to see. And they looked at these two prosecutors, who seemed to be bright, articulate, educated, and they assumed that they were taking care of business. But they were not taking care of business. What I'm telling you is that for all intents and purposes, these prosecutors in their final summation conceded the conspiracy issue by default. Because of their extreme incompetence and their abysmal lack of preparation, they literally did not contest the main issue at the trial. Make no mistake about it. Furman was the defense's salvation, and one way or another, they would have gotten him up there on that witness stand, even if they had to carry him up there on a stretcher to do so. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word 
in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective Fulton? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. And I was trying to litigate in my own mind Bailey's questions, and this was the first place that the prosecution abandoned me. You can object any time, Marsha. Just jump in and play any time. But she didn't. I don't know if it was fear or she just figured she'd just let it ride. But whatever, Bailey made his, uh, made his mark, and he went on from there. I was totally shocked when Furman answered the question from Bailey that he hadn't used the word in 10 years. And I believe Furman was the only one in the courtroom that didn't realize he was being set up at that point. I think everybody else knew that, he was, that Furman was being set up by Bailey. Well, this is probably the only area where Bailey actually did some, uh, I'm not going to say careful legal work, but he was very crafty. Uh, he had already intimidated Ito, and he knew that he would probably, in this issue, be able to ask questions in a way he would never normally be able to ask. And, and that being said, I'm talking about a compound question expecting a singular answer. And that was the, the death of me. Uh, and of course it could have been the salvation of me at the same time, but of course we always, in this case, took the most negative side. Uh, he asked me a compound question. Well, I'd, I've never called anybody that. It doesn't mean I haven't said that. And then you have Johnny Cochran in his own office using the word as an endearment and then going to court and saying that I'm an evil person and probably the worst law enforcement officer in the history of law enforcement because of the same thing that they just did at lunch. This is the interesting thing. I'm in Marsha Clark's office. We're talking about my impending testimony coming up in the trial. And Darden kind of peeks in, just kind of hangs his head inside, asks Marsha a question, and then looks at me and he says, remember you didn't use the N-word in the last 10 years. That doesn't sound like preparation, does it? This is not now the Furman trial. This is a trial about the man that murdered my son. It became as though having used the N-word was a worse crime than having killed two people. After Furman denied using the racial slur nigger on the witness stand, the defense offered the testimony of several witnesses that he had used that racial slur in their presence in a very disparaging way. In addition, they introduced excerpts from the now infamous Furman tapes. Tape recordings of conversations Furman had between April of 1985 and July of 1994 with one Laura Hart McKinney, an aspiring North Carolina screenwriter who was writing a screenplay about police women. In the tape conversations, there were 41 uses of the N-word also in a highly disparaging way. McKinney had agreed to pay Furman $10,000 for his services as a consultant if the script was picked up. Since the script was fictional, the argument was made, at least by some, that nothing Furman said should be taken seriously. But the consensus was that the statements Furman made on the close to 14 hours of tape, though most assuredly part bluster to increase the marketability of the script so he could collect his fee, essentially reflected Furman's state of mind with respect to blacks. I didn't think about these tapes when I was on the stand, and it's not that I didn't know they existed, but there was no guilt associated with them. Uh, you know, we did a screenplay. Big deal. Yes, there were embarrassing, uh, brutal, um, insensitive, cruel comments on those tapes, but they weren't made to be in a courtroom about a double murder trial. They were for a fictional screenplay about cops. How could you make those statements, even for a script, knowing a screenwriter has them on tape? I mean, without somehow qualifying on those tapes what you're saying. Uh, I can't believe, and he's, Furman is not stupid. He's a bright guy. Um, for the life of me, I can't understand him doing that. It was absolutely, no doubt, the work of a fictional screenplay. This was a screenplay that was copyrighted. I was a partner in this project. I was probably the sole source for almost every character in it. And, and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that he was, 
he was uh, making these tapes for the screenwriter, and, and I know, you know, he had some amorous thoughts towards her and everything else. That's all fine, but did he ever stop to consider what the ramifications could be, even without a Simpson trial? To me, it's just absolutely amazing that, that uh, he would do that with, without somehow trying to qualify these things. It was interesting that the prosecution never produced the screenplay in court, never produced the agent that was handling the sale of it, never produced the several producers that met with Laura McKinney and I about producing this. That, in effect, shows a fictional work. And you look at something like Joseph Wamba's book, The Choir Boys, there is 14 statements in there that equal or supersede anything in these tapes. And that's what made it into his book, a fictional book that is based loosely on actual events. That's what the cover says. Do we consider Joe Wamba a racist? Nope. Was he an LAP detective? Yep. Was he involved in this case and found crucial evidence? Nope. End of story. Now, if you're a halfway decent prosecutor, what you do is you sit Mark Furman down for a half hour and you tell Mark the facts of life. And the facts of life are, you don't ask Mark if he used the N-word. You tell him you know he did and that he's going to testify to the truth on that witness stand. He's not going to jeopardize the prosecution. How do you know he used the N-word? The defense in this case, under the reciprocal discovery law of the state of California, had already furnished the prosecution with the statements of two witnesses who seemed to be credible people with no ax to grind. One of them even said publicly that she believed Simpson was guilty. And in their statements, they said they were present when Furman used the N-word. The prosecution also had Furman's disability pension hearing transcript back in 1981 when he used the N-word. You give me a half hour with Mark Furman, and I guarantee you he would have admitted using the N-word on the witness stand. What you do then is you preempt the defense and put the issue behind you. It becomes a dead issue. In fact, Furman would have actually gained credibility with the jury if he'd done that. I was mentioning earlier the book written by the three black jurors. And in the book, one of them said, why didn't he admit that? We know the police use words like that to describe the black criminal element out on the street. Not only didn't the prosecution preempt the defense on this issue, but when the defense introduced evidence of Furman's racism, what did the prosecution do? They joined in the vilification of Mark Furman. I'm not even going to call him Detective Furman if I can help it, because he doesn't deserve that title. He doesn't warrant that kind of respect. Is he a racist? Yes. Is he the worst LAPD has to offer? Yes. Do we wish that this person was never hired by LAPD? Yes. Should LAPD have ever hired him? No. Should such a person be a police officer? No. In fact, do we wish there were no such person on the planet? Yes. She went so far as to say that she wished I was never born. In essence, I was dead. Isn't that a little extreme, Marcia? I mean, could we not say that about maybe the defendant? He killed two people. Marcia went overboard in her final, final argument about Furman, yes. She should have touched on it. She should have said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we know that Mr. Furman used the N-word, but we also know that Mr. Furman didn't do anything else wrong in this case. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, she went too far with it. Uh, to say, you know, do we wish someone was never born or, you know, whatever, uh, that's, that's a little heavy for anybody. Marshall went too far. Edel's ruling on the Furman matter was incorrect, but he compounded it and made it even worse. On August 29th, Ito did something that was inexcusable and for which there wasn't any possible legal argument to be made in support of it. He decided over the strenuous objections of the prosecutors to play all 41 excerpts in open court outside the presence of the jurors for a vast TV audience to hear. Since he had ruled that the jury could only hear two out of the 41 excerpts, what conceivable reason was there to play the 39 others for millions of people who weren't on the jury? It served no purpose other than to enrage and inflame the black community and millions of others. Moreover, the contents of the tapes most likely reached the jurors through the weekly conjugal visits. Edo knew there was no legal basis for what he did, but he came up with the non-legal justification that he did not want to be accused of, quote, suppressing information of vital public interest, unquote. 
If that were his concern, why didn't he just release them after the trial, only a month away? As reporter Tony Morrow observed at the time, Judge Lance Ito has repeatedly criticized participants in the O.J. Simpson trial for playing to the public instead of the jury. Yet in deciding to air racially charged tape comments, Ito said he was doing it for no other reason but to satisfy public interest. In 1994, Mark Furman worked very hard to free a black man by the name of Eric Harris, who was charged with the murder of a white man, Sean Stewart. Furman was the lead detective on the case and secured a criminal complaint against Harris for the murder. But when Furman received information later that someone else may have been the killer, he went out and investigated further and formed the opinion that Harris was innocent. What does he do? He goes down to the DA's office and gets them to dismiss the case against Harris. Now when you have the Furman tapes being perceived by everyone as extremely damaging to the prosecution, don't you automatically offer to this predominantly black jury the fact that Mark Furman worked hard to free a black man charged with the murder of a white man? It's almost criminal that the prosecutors in this case did not do that. I asked Ron Phillips, who was Furman's partner, Ron, did Clark and Darden know about the Harris case? He said, of course they did. I gave them the Harris file. There was a man that was killed, a white man, that was shot to death in a car driven by someone else. Eric Harris... Uh, supposedly threatened to kill this person um, several weeks prior. Uh, Eric Harris was supposedly a narcotics dealer. Uh, anyway, evidence mounted up to the point where I had to get Eric Harris in the station for an interrogation. I did that. He arrived. Brad Roberts and I interrogated him for hours. Not 32 minutes, hours. And I came to the conclusion that he no doubt knows who committed this murder, but although all this evidence points towards him, I do not believe he was the shooter. He would not budge. He made a statement about a polygraph. Uh, we took him up on it. And uh, the results of that were he knows about it, but I can't tell if he's the shooter, but it doesn't appear so. Nonetheless, if he won't help himself, I had to book him and write the evidence up as it was. I did that. The case was filed, and I got this gut feeling, and I told Brad Roberts, and he got the same thing. I go, I just don't think he did it. So I went out into the community where he lived, and I started circulating to a lot of the people I know on the street that I didn't think Harris was a shooter. And I need some help on the, on the street. I need help to point me in the right direction. I need to know who did. Well, lo and behold, about five days later, somebody calls first anonymously, and said he didn't do it, describes how the murder went down, it fit with everything. I mean, this person actually saw it. And uh, they said, we know who committed the murder, but I won't testify. I said, that's fine, meet me. Well, I don't want to be burned on this. I protected uh, that person's identity. They passed the polygraph. I identified the suspect, and my investigation pivoted on that. I went to court, and I released Eric Harris in court. What has to rank as one of the most startling utterances to come from the prosecutors in the Simpson case was William Hodgman, the senior member of the prosecution team, telling the Los Angeles Times after the verdict that he and his co-prosecutors had information, quote, about how Mark Furman as a detective was a very professional detective, that in a number of instances he worked hard to clear suspects who happened to be African American when new evidence exonerating them came out. But Bill, if you had evidence like this, don't you think it would have been a good idea to share it with the jury? Unbelievable. He's right. They had stacks of rebuttal evidence. Stacks of it. Did they use it? No. They would have had to jump on Mark Furman's side. But after all, I was a prosecution witness. Isn't that what they're supposed to do? Well, the determining factor that made me the recipient of all the accusations and really the point man for the defense to attack was that they couldn't effectively eliminate the glove. It was the most destructive piece of evidence. It had the, bloods of, the blood of both victims and their client. They could not get rid of the glove, so they had to get rid of the man who found it. Was the testimony that you gave at the preliminary hearing in this case completely truthful? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Is it your intention to assert your Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to all questions that I ask you? Yes. yes.
I didn't want to take the fifth, but I needed somebody called a prosecutor to talk to me before I took the stand to see a strategy in what we were going to do and to know full well that I was going to have somebody to object on my behalf when there was an absurd, ridiculous, immaterial, irrelevant question by the defense. Marsha Clark was not going to do that. You know, prosecutors talk to convicted murderers and child molesters, rapists, drug dealers, just to make a case. And yet this prosecutor would not talk to a 20-year veteran that wrote a screenplay with a writer 10 years before, 9 years before, 8 years before. That was the period we're talking about. I think that was the worst thing he did, was taking the Fifth Amendment. It would have made more sense to me for Furman to get up and say, yes, I was untruthful on that point, but, uh, but you know what, I never planted any evidence in this case. And to uh, take the Fifth Amendment just leaves the specter. It puts everybody under the same umbrella. It leaves the feeling with everybody that we all did something wrong. And we know that's not true. I'm trying to survive, and I'm doing it all by myself. You know, police officers being disappointed I did, well, I'm sorry about that, but, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing you can do. And, you know, I understand when there's nothing you can do, you do what you got to do, and you survive to fight again. Both prosecutors handled the allegation that Mark Furman planted a bloody glove at Simpson's Rockingham estate, one of the most explosive allegations by the defense at the trial, very poorly. Clark did argue that Furman could not have planted the glove because, quote, all the other officers who were there before him saw only one glove. But to dismiss this highly critical fact with just these few words is exceptionally weak and flabby advocacy. Such a brief reference could easily have gone over the heads of, or been missed by, the jury. They could have said, okay, so there was only one glove. So what? Clark should have ensured that the jurors drew the desired inference. After telling them only one glove was found, she should have spoon-fed the jury with the absolutely necessary follow-up reality that, therefore, there was no second glove at the Bundy murder scene for Detective Furman to have picked up and deposited at the defendant's Rockingham estate. Because of its importance, this fact should have been repeated and even referred to once again in Clark's later final address to the jury, but it was not. It should be noted that Clark grossly overstated the evidence she presented when she told the jury that, quote, all the other officers who were there before Furman saw only one glove. Although an LAPD investigation revealed that the 14 uniform officers who arrived at the Bundy murder scene before Furman all saw only one glove there, the prosecution very unwisely only called two of the 14 to testify to that fact. When you have 14 witnesses to prove a critical point in your case and realizing that in the eyes of the jury, the more who testify to a point, the less likely all of them are lying, why in the world would you only call two? Clark probably should have called all 14 officers to the stand. But even with the two she did call, she should have made the obvious and critical observation to the jury that for them to buy the defense allegation that Furman had planted the glove at Rockingham and hence committed perjury in denying it, the jurors would necessarily have had to conclude that these two officers who testified they only saw one glove were also committing perjury, a highly unlikely event. As weak as Clark's effort was in handling the Furman matter, she did at least make an effort. We know it was weak and unconvincing because several jurors post-trial said they believed Furman had planted the glove. But if Clark was weak on Furman, Darden was ten times worse. His argument on Furman bordered on the unbelievable. Not once in his very brief reference to Furman did he assert or even vaguely imply that Furman was telling the truth about finding the glove. In fact, in his remarks to the jurors, he almost seemed to suggest the opposite. But I am asking you to put it in the, in the proper perspective. You define what it's worth. You define what it means. If it helps you in assessing its credibility, and it should, or with lack of credibility, I don't know, then you use it. Isn't Darden just about saying, by implication, that he agrees that because Furman lied about not using the racial slur, he may have also lied about not planting the glove? I mean, when Darden said, referring to Furman's lie about using the racial slur, if it helps you in assessing his credibility, and it should, what does that mean? 
particularly when Darden didn't then go on and defend Furman's credibility on the issue of whether he was telling the truth or lying when he said he found the glove on Simpson's Rockingham estate. He simply abruptly left the subject completely and went on to another part of his summation. Planting or tampering with evidence that would lead to someone's conviction in a death penalty case, guess what? You get the death penalty too. Uh, is this an absurd thing to even accuse somebody of with a absent of no evidence? In fact, I'm the only person to collect evidence that would show I didn't. Did I plant Cato Kalin? How did I know that he would say that? There was only one glove to begin with at uh, Bundy. There were, I believe, 15 officers and fire department personnel at the location before Furman was even notified of the murder scene. They all took notes. They all realized there was only one glove at that scene. And as far as him being able to transport something in our presence and plant it in our presence, it was physically impossible. It could have never happened. I was a respected, good detective, uncorruptible, direct, thorough, and they could not deal with this. They couldn't beat me on crime and the law, so they beat me on a personal level. Let me mention something here that I feel compelled to, only because I have been asked about it so often. When you don't offer extremely incriminating evidence of guilt against a defendant, and you don't even offer evidence that would substantially help exonerate Mark Furman, who is the main prosecution witness upon whom the defense is basing their entire conspiracy theory, this type of conduct is so extreme that it would naturally cause a reasonable person to ask the logical question, was there a payoff here? Because if there wasn't a payoff, the thinking goes. Things like this simply don't happen. I give absolutely no credence at all to such a possibility, which, as I said, has been made to me by many, many people in both letters and conversations. The prosecutors were honorable people, and never in a million years would I accept the notion that the DA's office would in any way be a party to throw in a case. I can simply say, however, that the incompetence in this case, the conduct of the prosecutors was so bad that no one could be blamed for instinctively asking themselves, was there a payoff? But as I say, I reject that notion out of hand as being absurd on its face. It was pure, simple, unadulterated incompetence of an extreme nature. You know, for uh, defense attorneys to uh, argue in court about contamination in a crime scene, every, every defense attorney knows every crime scene is contaminated. And they know that you can't levitate over a crime scene to go in and collect evidence. At some point, you have to walk in. Someone has to go in to the blood. And uh, for them to argue, uh, you know, it was a great argument for a jury. But for, but for anybody that uh, knows anything at all about a crime scene, it was total nonsense. The defense got a hold of a, uh, a media tape of uh, Fung's partner, Andrea Mazzola touching the ground with a gloved hand. And Sheck had built the temple up to showing this thing to the point that everyone was on the edge of their seats waiting to see this. And when you see Andrea touch the ground, there was a gasp in the audience. <laughs> and it was just hilarious that, that he built them into this, and built this temple in this thing and, and stirred everybody up expecting this as though this were the end of the world. My gosh, contamination. She touched the ground with a gloved hand. Well, so what? I mean, how did that affect that blood sample? You're never going to see another case with so much DNA evidence as this case. There never has been. There never will be. I mean, there's virtually hundreds of pieces of evidence that went to the guilt of O.J. Simpson. Most people go to prison on one, one drop. They go to death row. And here we couldn't convict a man with hundreds of pieces of evidence that only pointed to one person, him. Why was every blood sample degraded and contaminated to the extent that it contained the DNA of O.J. Simpson or the DNA of one of the victims? I don't understand that. It was smoke. It was nonsense. It was then, it is today, and the worst part of all of this is that defense team knows well that that's, that's what the story is with that. If one were to believe the Bronx lawyer, all the blood, hair, and fiber evidence in the case was either planted by the LAPD detectives or contaminated by the incompetent police department criminalists who collected and preserved it. 
Since both Cochran and Scheck also insinuated that the criminalists themselves may have been a part of the planning or at least the cover-up, and that the LAPD detectives were incompetent in many ways, they were arguing simultaneously that the same sophisticated conspirators who framed Simpson were also incredible bumblers. Cochran and Scheck were picking and choosing, trying to have it both ways. The core of Scheck's contamination argument was that the LAPD Scientific Investigation Division, or SID, was a, quote, cesspool of contamination, a black hole, and that once the blood evidence was contaminated in the evidence processing room, or before it got there through exposure to the elements, it didn't make any difference how many times it was thereafter tested for DNA. Remember garbage in, garbage out? It may be of some interest to note that while the Simpson trial was taking place, an article appeared in the Los Angeles Times concerning the exhumation of former President Zachary Taylor's body and the testing of his DNA for traces of poisoning. Apparently, if we're to believe the defense in the Simpson case, a hundred plus years in the ground is not as damaging to DNA as several hours being exposed to the elements. As has been stated, contamination cannot change someone's DNA into someone else's. And if you're not going to argue this point to the jury over and over again, why in the heck even bother to stand up in front of the jury? So how effective was Marsha Clark in making this critical point to the jury? If you have contamination, what you should expect to find are results that are out of sync, willy-nilly, if you will. Marsha, please, this in no way tells anyone, particularly this jury, that contamination can't change someone else's blood into Simpsons. In fact, by failing to tell the jury explicitly that contamination cannot do this, it actually leaves that possibility open. But the outrageous Sheck had another theory up his snake oil salesman's sleeve for the jury. In those cases where contamination or degradation didn't invalidate the results, listen to this, folks, there was cross-contamination. In other words, Sheck hypothesized, some of the blood had become so degraded because of bacteria, sunlight, moisture, etc., that it had lost all of its DNA thereafter because of negligence and inadvertence. These were the moments the LAPD was taking a breather from their planning of evidence. The blood that had been removed from Simpson's arm for comparison purposes and was in a vial was accidentally spilled onto some of the degraded evidence blood, thus being a reason why evidence blood came back from the DNA laboratories identified as Simpson's. What evidence did Sheck have that this actually happened? None. Because the LAPD crime lab, per Sheck, was a cesspool of contamination, it could have happened, he argued, and that was good enough. He told the jury that, quote, if there was cross-contamination, unquote, the results would be invalid. There was a cesspool of contamination in this laboratory. No mistake about it. Cesspool of contamination. You know what I would say about Barry Sheck's comment about it being a cesspool of contamination was, we, we sent uh, samples of the evidence that was recovered to three different laboratories. Samples, not the same one tested by LAPD, but samples were sent to uh, Cellmark, a private laboratory, California Department of Justice, and the FBI laboratories, and all their findings were exactly the same as LAPD, so it couldn't have been too much of a cesspool. In spite of the garbage in, garbage out, contamination everywhere in the LAPD lab when we did PCR typing on the planted stains they gave the right answers so I mean they were very selective about what was really garbage out the, the stuff was conceitedly the right answer um, unfortunately none of these points were made in the argument although Cochran and Sheck who saw planting or contamination everywhere argued that Simpson's blood was planted on the rear gate at Bundy that the Rockingham glove was planted, that Simpson's and Nicole's blood was planted on the socks in Simpson's bedroom, and that Simpson's, Nicole's, and Ron Goldman's blood was planted in the Bronco, all by the LAPD. Neither of them argued that the five blood drops at the murder scene, the most incriminating evidence against Simpson in the entire case, were planted. In fact, Cochran never even dealt with the issue. We've already covered the EAPB, the Bundy blood drops that Mr. Sheck did such a great job on, and, and you know about those drops. You know the numbers as well as we do. What great job? Sheck's argument that the five blood drops at the murder scene had become cross-contaminated at the LAPD crime lab with blood from Simpson's reference vial was an entirely fallacious one. 
the lead homicide detective in this case, and we've talked it about a little, and we'll talk about it some more, is walking around with an unsealed blood vial for three hours. It's unheard of. Van Adder, the man who carries the blood. Furman, the man who finds the glove. Remember those two phrases. Van Adder, the man who carries the blood. Why is he doing that? Why is Van Adder carrying Mr. Simpson's blood out there? Why is he doing that? So Van Adder, the man who carries the blood, starts lying in this case from the very, very beginning, trying to cover up for this rest of judgment. That was crap in a word. And anybody with half an ounce of brain could have seen through that. But what got to me, and I was in the court that day, was just the, the, the venomous way that he delivered it. I think the bottom line of all of this is he inserted the race card, and as Bob Shapiro said after, we not only played the race card, we dealt it from the bottom of the deck. I think that pretty much says it. But the point that really got me was when Cochran put up his sign during his final arguments, Van Adder's Big Lies. Cochran knew he was lying, knew he was lying, but he had the intestinal fortitude to get up in front of a national television audience and tell lies. And I was so angry that if I could have gotten my hands around Mr. Cochran's neck, I would have probably been in, on, on trial for murder. That's how angry I was with him. But I realized that being a Los Angeles police officer, you can't do things like that. But I would have loved to put my hands around his neck and choked him because I saw him stand up and lie to the public when he knew he was lying. And I lost all respect for him at that point. Johnny Cochran made allegations of me planting blood. Johnny Cochran made allegations of me lying about the circumstances of going over the wall. He knew that that was false. He knew that. But he made them anyway. It didn't matter. If the prosecutors, in their never-ending incompetence, had not refused to introduce Simpson's tape-recorded interview with Lang and Van Adder, the jury would have known that Van Adder would not have felt any need to plant any of Simpson's blood at Rockingham. Why? Because by the time he brought the vial to Rockingham, Simpson had already admitted to him and Lang several hours earlier that he had bled all over his Rockingham estate, in his Bronco and home, and on his driveway. But even without the taped interview, wouldn't you think that Clark and Darden, in their arguments to the jury, would each have had a lot to say to counter this charge that went to the very heart of the defense's conspiracy allegation? That in the months since the defense leveled the charge, at least one of them would have thought about and written down what they were going to say to the jury about this extremely important defense charge. Unbelievably, in Clark and Darden's opening and closing arguments, they never said one word, not one word between them, to try to knock down this core defense argument about Van Natter's bringing the vial of Simpson's blood back to Rockingham. They never once even touched on the issue. Once again, the lawyers for the people just took it on the chin without offering any defense or fighting back at all. Either they thought that by not mentioning the Van Adder vile blood problem at all, it would somehow evaporate by itself into thin air, or their lack of preparation was so abysmally and shamefully poor, and this is undoubtedly what happened, they never even bothered to jot down at any time during the trial that in their summations they obviously had to respond to this charge in a very powerful way. You only have huge gaps in your argument like this when you've devoted no time to its preparation in any murder case, but particularly one where the prosecution knew millions of people were going to be watching. This is astonishing. I could have planted blood, I could have planted evidence, but why would I pick O.J. Simpson to plant evidence on? Why would I take the chance of facing the same penalty that O.J. Simpson would face by trying to frame a man like O.J. Simpson? Why would anybody in their right minds, after 27 years on the police department, put their whole life and their family and their career in jeopardy for someone like O.J. Simpson? Why would I do something like that? It doesn't make sense. I guess one could say it's to their credit that Johnny Cochran and the other members of the defense team had sufficient theatrical skills to keep straight faces when they suggested in their summation 
Van Adder's actions to the jury. You know, they, they talked about in court about uh, Detective Van Adder running around Los Angeles, running around the city of Los Angeles with a vial of blood in his pocket for three hours. And of how, how, he, how he run back to the crime scene and sprinkled blood. Total nonsense. There still should be ethics. I, I mean, it's fine to attack the investigation. That's what they should do. They should attack the investigation. They should attack the evidence. That's part of their job. But let's tell the truth. Let's don't lie. Let's don't tell knowing lies about it. But you know what I'm proud of? I went through the Los Angeles Police Department for 27 years and never had one formal complaint. You know that speaks for itself. I would find it hard to believe that any prosecutors in any previous important and publicized case in America ever gave closing arguments any worse than those of the prosecutors in this case. I mean, when you get to the point where you don't even open up your mouth and utter one single word on an extremely critical issue, the defense's accusation of Van Adder's planning blood, how can it get any worse? Let me state my belief again that the LAPD and the crime lab did an adequate job in this case. It was the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office that performed incompetently. And from what you have learned in this program, that fact should be as obvious as the fact that O.J. Simpson is a murderer. Yet somehow it completely escaped the media. Syndicated columnist William Rusher wrote, quote, I simply cannot imagine the prosecution's overwhelming case against Simpson being presented better than it was presented by Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden. They lost for reasons that were certainly no fault of theirs, unquote. I simply cannot imagine anyone being able to make a statement like that. But in fact, the overwhelming sentiment in the entire country was that the prosecutors had done a good job and were in no way to blame for the not guilty verdict. Newsweek magazine captured this overriding consensus when it told its readers on September the 30th, 1996, quote, it is accepted wisdom now that prosecutors lost the criminal trial virtually the day the predominantly African-American jury was sworn in, unquote. Although it may sound hard to believe, the fact of the matter is that until outrage was published on June 10th, 1996, not one book, not one magazine article, not one public figure or talking head on TV, or even any person involved or associated with this case in any way, investigative or otherwise, blame the prosecution for the not guilty verdict. Jeffrey Tubin, a lawyer who covered the trial for the New Yorker magazine, wrote, it is difficult to imagine how else Clark might have tried the case. The result, it now seems, was preordained. He described Clark as being, quote, at times brilliant. I thought the prosecution did a damn good job, was the assessment of Joseph de Geneva a respected former prosecutor who was one of the most prominent talking heads covering the trial. Only since outrage is the realization setting in that the prosecution, as well as the jury, must be held accountable. O.J. Simpson reportedly began production today of a taped infomercial giving his version of events surrounding the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Now, this is the uh, Rockingham Gate to my home. It's west. A lot of people have asked me about Simpson's video that he was selling mail order. It's really interesting that after the verdict, Simpson challenged Marsha Clark to get in a room with him and debate the case, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And he wanted to really lay everything out in an interview with NBC's Tom Brokaw and Katie Couric, eventually called off by a civil lawyer. And, of course, the title of his book was I Want to Tell You. All of this showed he was a real stand-up guy, no BS. He wanted to tell everyone what really went down, tell it like it is. But he didn't want to tell it like it is to the jury at his trial, the only 12 people who held his life in their hands, the 12 people who could have convicted him of first-degree murder and sent him to prison for the rest of his life. In over nine months of trial, he had no desire to say one single word to them. But after the trial, he wanted to talk to everyone else about what happened. People have asked me if I've watched Simpson's video, and this is what I tell them. I know two things. I know this man is guilty, and I also know he's not going to admit it in his video. No, I did not kill anybody, and I could not and would not. He's going to lie. Therefore, what conceivable reason would I have for taking up my time watching it? So no, I have not watched it, nor do I ever plan to. All of the people who should have been screaming had their heads in the sand. Uh, I think one of the reasons I admire Vince is because he was one of those 
higher profile people who didn't stick his head in the sand. There should have been outrage. The mayor should have been screaming. The council people should have been hollering. There should have been demonstrations in the street when this guy was acquitted. Do you think that many black Americans feel that O.J. Simpson, being black, should have gone free, regardless of the truth, in order to gain some sort of racial payback against the white majority's discrimination of them throughout the years? Because a great number of Americans believe this, the Simpson case may cause long-term harm to race relations in America. I'm not guilty of... <laughs> The sad legacy of the Simpson case, outside of the immediate personal tragedy of two families who lost their loved ones and a murderer walking free, is that many white Americans are now beginning to reassess their views of their fellow black Americans. Let me tell you what Newsweek said in its October 16, 1995 edition, two weeks after the verdict. What was different and disturbing about the racial talk last week was that so many white liberals sounded fed up. Many middle-class professionals who have always supported integration, maintained office and social friendships with African Americans, and resisted the backlash against affirmative action, were appalled by what black novelist Dennis Williams called the end zone dance over the Simpson acquittal. It made them wonder aloud whether they really knew African Americans as well as they thought they did, and whether the racial gap wasn't much wider than they had believed. For the people in this country, both whites and blacks, who have dedicated their lives to ending racial hatred, intolerance, and bigotry, these words must bring tears to their eyes, as if African Americans haven't suffered enough throughout this nation's history due to the color of their skin. Because of their fiercely partisan and ultimately unjustified support for someone most know to be a cold-blooded killer, they may not only have contributed to their continuing misfortune, but increased it. It's one thing to defend someone you know is guilty, even defend them vigorously. Our system of justice not only allows, but encourages this. But inasmuch as the defense lawyers had to know that Simpson was guilty of these two terribly brutal murders, I personally wonder how they could possibly have found it within themselves to go far beyond a vigorous representation, defending him with the same passion and fervor with which one would defend his own parents, wife, or children who were being charged with a serious crime. By the way, that brings up what I consider to be another very interesting point. If you're defending someone and you strongly believe they're innocent, when the jury comes back with a verdict of not guilty, aren't you going to be very happy about it? Look at this photo at the moment of the announcement of the jury's verdict. Shapiro looks like he just heard that a member of his family has been run over. Kardashian has this incredible open mouth look of disbelief. And Bailey shows no emotion whatsoever. This is not the way people look and react when they believe their client is innocent and has been found not guilty. Even Simpson's got this quizzical look on his face like, what? You're actually going to let me walk out of here? I don't think one member of my family cried. We were so stunned. I mean, I at least thought that there was going to be a hung jury. I guess I just still had that hope of it being a hung jury. But I couldn't cry. I was like numb. I was like dead. I was like shocked that it went that route but then on the other hand I wasn't shocked at all because of what had happened throughout the whole process of the trial and when we went in the back we were taken upstairs into the DA's office again and um, Gil Garcetti comes in and makes his little speech of oh I'm so sorry I thought you son of a bitch you heartless son of a bitch you're so sorry you turn this thing into a goddamn mockery of a trial, and you're so sorry. To listen to Cochran and Shapiro and all of them stand up there and, and proclaim all the innocence, then try your, your, your case according to the evidence. Okay, you don't have to bring in all this other crap. You don't have to say that everybody's a racist, everybody's a liar. If your client is so innocent, then the, then the evidence should prove that. You shouldn't have to pull in all this other baloney. I think the defense attorneys saw the value in winning this case not for Simpson I think they knew he was a murderer I mean you'd have to be an idiot not to conclude that they were using him as nothing more than uh, uh, TV time I mean God what would a defense attorney pay for a year on primetime TV 
eight hours a day. Well, that's what these guys got. And they got reputations out of it, and they got TV shows out of it, and they got million dollar book deals out of it. They got everything they ever wanted. And Johnny Cochran, isn't it odd? He doesn't even talk about it anymore. Um, Johnny Cochran, I think, is a, hmm, if I ever com committed a murder, which I wouldn't because I'm a peaceful girl, thank God. But if I did, I'd hire him because he would get me off, no matter what. He's a despicable person who has no soul and no principle and no character and no integrity. And it doesn't seem like he has a social conscience at all. And that's the problem I have with the defense team. They do nothing for, this, for our, our society except tear it down and make it acceptable to... I mean, he showed, the, he showed the children of the world that as long as you make enough money, you can kill anybody and get away with it. Great lesson. Great lesson for our children. That's what I think of Johnny Cochran. When we were at the wake, Robert Shapiro came, and uh, he came up to me, and he said, Denise, can we talk? And I said, yeah, sure. And he says, Denise, can we exhume the body? I said, what? I said, what does that mean? Because I had no idea. I'd never heard that word before. I didn't know what it meant. And he says, to unbury it. I said, what? I said, for God's sakes, I said, she's laying right there. I said, she's not even buried yet, and you want to unbury her? Tomorrow after, she, or tomorrow after the funeral? I said, what are you, crazy? I was shocked that he would come up to me. He says, Denise, we have to do an autopsy of our own. And my only thought was, what do you have to do? Plant some evidence? You have to, you have to make your own stuff up that wasn't so? I, I, just, I, I just was shocked by that kind of a remark. I couldn't believe that he would have the gall to come up to me and ask me, can we exhume the body? It was clear he did that. And that whole long-winded answer about how all these things are so painful. And a word about Barry Sheck, who has a reputation as a lawyer for the poor and dispossessed, having worked for three years as a legal aid lawyer in the Bronx. He and his colleague, Peter Neufeld, later created the Innocence Project, which has reportedly used DNA testing to free a dozen innocent people previously convicted of crimes. But in the Simpson case, where we know Simpson was guilty, Sheck showed just how conceptually pristine and intellectually honest his innocence project really is. Pristine and honest all the way up to the point of a big publicity case beckoning him to oppose justice for a man he had to know was guilty of murder. As far as integrity, Sheck has none. To engineer all of these so-called experts in here to say this could have happened and that could have happened, none of them with any substantive evidence that any of it did happen. Uh, no, he's a, he is not a, a, a real uh, type of person that has any amount of credibility in my mind. The defense attorneys in this case perpetrated an enormous fraud on the jury, but instead of then quietly stealing away into the night with their stolen booty, after the trial they audaciously rubbed it in our faces and tried to perpetrate the same fraud on the American people. Can you imagine Robert Shapiro titling his book on the Simpson case, The Search for Justice, and Johnny Cochran titling his, Journey to Justice? How can you have justice when a brutal murderer walks out the courtroom door, a free man with a smile on his face? Since Shapiro and Cochran both know Simpson is guilty, out of the thousands upon thousands of words in the English language, couldn't they have found any other word that fit their needs and purpose other than the word justice? To paraphrase Attorney Joseph Welch's remark to Senator Joseph McCarthy during U.S. Senate hearings in June of 1954, have Cochran and Shapiro at long last no sense of decency? Where do they get the guts to spend an entire year in open court in front of millions of people desperately trying to prevent, frustrate, and thwart justice and then try to tell us that actually what they were doing was fighting for justice? Again, where do you buy guts like this? There was not a day that went by in that trial, not a day when Johnny Cochran did not stand up and say, 
to the judge, this trial is a search for truth. Ha, ha, ha. I reject totally supposed feelings of people that on an, on an everyday basis would do anything under the sun, including cheating, lying, reporting mistruths, all for the purpose of making certain that their client goes free. These are not people who are interested in the truth. These are people who are only interested in seeing their client go free, and they will do it at all costs. The scary part about it is, this, as Robert Kardashian was accusing me of being hunted down by Colombian drug lords, his children were staying at my house, sleeping over and going ice skating. And, you know, this was the extent of the hypocrisy and the insanity of the trial. Johnny Cochran does not ask deep philosophical questions such as, is my client guilty? I don't believe that he does that. I asked Johnny Cochran's ex-wife that same question, Barbara Barry Cochran, uh, who is a friend of mine. I said, do you think Johnny thinks O.J. Simpson is guilty? And she said, Larry, I've known him a long time. He doesn't ask himself these kinds of questions. It would get in the way of what he has to do. He doesn't think about it. He doesn't care. You come to me, you have the money, you tell me what you think we can do, I tell you what we think we can do, and we go from there. As far as guilt or innocence in a moral sense, Johnny Cochran couldn't care less. All right, the defendant having been acquitted of both charges, he is ordered, transported to an appropriate chair's facility and released forthwith. All right, we'll stand in recess. What does the future hold for O.J. Simpson? From the moment of Simpson's acquittal and his last defiant courtroom look towards those who would dare prosecute him, there's been speculation as to whether or not Simpson would ever be accepted back into the good graces of the majority of the American people. So far he has not been, and I'm confident he never will be. In fact, after the trial, he wasn't even welcome in his own community of Brentwood, from which he has since moved. The board of directors of the Riviera Country Club expelled him from club membership, and many of his neighbors by signs such as, Welcome to Brentwood, home of the Brentwood Butcher. Let him know he was persona non grata. A national poll conducted by People Magazine asked golfers if they would remain in a foursome if Simpson were assigned to it. 61% said they would give up their spot and walk away rather than play. My guess is that Simpson will eventually be able to ease his way partially back into normal society. However, because there was such a massive torrent of publicity in this case, and over such a protracted period of time, the beliefs of those who feel he is guilty have hardened and become more immutable than they would normally be. And therefore, his road to rehabilitation will reach a point beyond which he will never proceed. O.J. Simpson will work his way into a position of acceptance in our society when Sirhan Sirhan does, when Charlie Manson does. That's when O.J. Simpson will work his way back into the hearts and minds of America. And since I don't think that's going to happen anytime too soon, I don't worry a whole lot about it. Whenever he does something stupid, the media is out, they make calls, and we as the foundation have to, have to get our message out there about domestic violence. Tell me something's not screwy there, that the media only comes when this man who killed two people comes out and says, oh, do you have a response? Do you have a reaction to this? I mean, where is media going? I mean, it's so tabloidy and so, so off the wall that they would even react to somebody like this. It's like if anybody lets him come back into society, it would be media that would let him come back into society because they're listening to him. And that's a scary thought to me. Why can he pick up a phone and somebody run out and interview him? What does he have to offer? They think he's going to confess to the murder or something? What does he have to offer other than that? He is a washed up football player, marginal sportscaster, terrible actor, and he's a double murderer. What does he have that we need? Does he do anything for the community? Does he do anything for mankind? Does he even do anything for his kids? If he wants to do something for his kids, let him go back and live with the Browns so they can have a halfway normal life. I do believe that the man actually thinks there's a chance. I think he thinks that there's a chance that society will accept him, that they'll forget. And I think that that's what he's waiting for. I think his 
going in and going out for business in other countries, Japan and so on and so forth, and England, you know, all of these we know for fact, making money off of Nicole's death and, you know, <laughs> blaming it on us because we won't let him make a living over here. God, it's our fault how terrible we are. Someone who butchered two individuals such as he did, in this case, without question, is capable of doing it again, certainly. I'm very afraid of Richie Simpson, what he'll do next. Because I think there will come a point in time where he knows that he will never be accepted again. And he will absolutely lose it. I don't think he's there yet. I don't think he, ha he, g he gets what's happened to him yet. And as he does try to ease his way back into society and attempts to rehabilitate his image with interviews like the one he gave Esquire magazine, he hopefully will be viewed by even more Americans for exactly what he is, a double murderer who got off because of wealth, racial bias, and the incompetence of the district attorney's office. Of course, it helps when he hints at his guilt in interviews, as he did in this article, in which he said, let's say I committed this crime. Even if I did do this, it would have to have been because I loved her very much, right? An incredible remark that generated quite a response. O.J. would think that Nicole made him murder her. I can just hear it now. Uh, you know, why did she make me do this? You know, it's her fault that I got so crazy. It's her fault. I, I can just see him now running it, running the litany of, of, of uh, <laughs> uh, dysfunctional thoughts that, you know, this, that she forced him to do it. All of us, even uh, the most calloused, are infected with something called a conscience. Uh, unless the guy is just a psychopath, which I'm not sure he is, uh, but he may be somewhat sociopathic. But uh, clearly those comments suggest to me that he does understand the difference between right and wrong. I don't believe that theory that he's convinced himself of not killing her. He's just convinced himself that it was her fault that he had to kill her. Let me leave you with these final thoughts. As we all know, O.J. Simpson was very popular before these murders. I've been told that if a popularity poll had been taken among employees when he was working in the sports casting department at NBC, he would have won hands down. He is a charming and personable human being in many ways. He is also a cold-blooded killer, as well as the most audacious one I have ever known. So incredibly audacious, in fact, that this is what Simpson thinks the future holds for him. It means nothing that Nicole is dead to him, and that article it summed O.J. Simpson up perfectly. I do not feel uh, guilt for the murder of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. I did not do he that. He murdered my sister. He always said he was going to kill her, and he finally did it. I will never see my son again. I've heard that um, Sidney and Justin are very intelligent kids. They're going to start reading books. Boyosi's book, Darden's book, Petrocelli's book. And someday, they're going to walk into the den where O.J. Simpson is drinking a vodka tonic. And those kids are going to look at O.J. Simpson in the eye, and they're going to say, Daddy, did you kill Mommy? And if you have kids, your kids know you, and you know your kids. And they know how you feel when you feel uncomfortable. There might be a twitch, or there might be a twitch down here, or there might be some sort of affectation that you do when you're nervous, when you're lying, when you're on the spot, that only somebody who knows you intimately can perceive. And that's going to happen. Sidney or Justin is going to look at O.J. Simpson in the eye and say, Daddy, did you kill Mommy? And he's going to reveal by his demeanor that he did. That's going to be O.J. Simpson's punishment. It's not as good as being on death row, but at least it's something. And I assure you that will happen.